Good morning again, everyone. This meeting is now called to order. Uh, first and foremost, let me uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator Risa Honteveros. And uh, I would like to greet everyone a happy new year. Uh, this is the first hearing of the uh, Philippine Senate. And uh, I, I hope that everyone had a very good um, vacation despite the uh, very challenging 2020. So before we go into uh, the topic on hand, uh, let me acknowledge, uh, let me uh, direct the committee secretary to acknowledge her resource persons for this morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. I would like to, uh, to acknowledge the virtual presence of our guests and resource persons for today's public hearing. From the uh, Department of Energy, um, we have ASEC Bodhi Pulido and Director Rino Abad with Ms. Laura Sagin. From the um, Energy Regulatory Commission, Mr. Arthur Villaraza. From the Philippine National Oil Company, Mr. Ronald Shua. From, from the Department of Health, Engineer Luis Cruz. From the Board of Investments, DTI, Mr. Dennis Panga. From the uh, Department of Trade and Industry, Bureau of Philippine Standards, Engineer Mario Gaudiano. From the Department of Finance, Attorney Karen Yambao. From the um, Philippine Competition Commission, Attorney Christina Fecondes de Sagon. From the Manila Electric Company, Meralco, Mr. Lawrence Fernandez. From the, uh, Philipp from the uh, First Gen Corporation, Mr. Jerome Kainglet. From the Gas Policy Development Project, GD, um, Dr. Rizalinda De Leon. From First Gas Power Corporation, Mr. Mark Miranda. From the Philippine Independent Power Producers Association, PIPA Attorney Ann Estorco Mantulibano. From Citizen Watch Philippines, Mr. Orlando Oxales. From Laban Consumer, Attorney uh, Victorio Mario Di Magiba, and from the U.S. Department of Commerce, Mr. Mohamed Badesi. Everyone has, everyone has been acknowledged, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Committee Secretary. Um, today we'll be tackling uh, Senate Bill Number 1819, and the title of this measure is An Act Providing for the National Energy Policy and Framework for the Development and Regulation of the Philippine Midstream Natural Gas Industry and for other purposes. And the aim of this bill is to develop the midstream natural gas industry in the Philippines in light of the impending depletion of the Malampaya Natural Gas Project. As we all know, the Philippines is not uh, alien to, nat to the use of natural gas. However, this will be the first time that we will be importing and developing the midstream sector of the natural gas uh, industry. At the same time, another aim is to create a framework for healthy competition that will redound to consumer benefit in terms of price and service. And uh, lastly, another aim uh, to encourage private capital and, pri and the private sector to take the lead in developing this nascent industry. So. Um, Today, we'll be uh, tackling the bill itself. We will go into the uh, bill itself. And admittedly, this is a work in progress. And I would like to thank all of our resource persons who have submitted their um, position paper. Let me uh, give special thanks to our uh, international resource persons who have given very detailed position paper. Thank you very much for your, um, for your um, uh, man hours, for the effort that you have given this committee in, in giving your thoughts and comments on the uh, bill on hand. Let me uh, make special mention Mr. Mohamed Badisi of the U.S. Department of Commerce who have uh, about almost two years in the making of this bill. He has uh, contributed a lot of his uh, experience, knowledge in the uh, development of the midstream and even the downstream natural gas industry. And let me also make special thanks to Professor Silke Goldberg of Herbert Smith and Fee Hills. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for also giving your very detailed position paper. 
I know that you have vast experience in the uh, European Union uh, natural gas industry and uh, your comments and thoughts on this bill and your assistance to the development of the midstream natural gas industry in the Philippines is highly appreciated. And with that, I understand, Professor uh, Silke, that you are in the UK right now. And um, to be honest, one of the positive offshoots of this pandemic is uh, we have learned to use um, virtual uh, hearings. And because of the virtual hearings, we have managed to invite international experts uh, from across the world. And Professor Silke right now is in the UK, and the time in the UK is 1 a 1 11 a.m. And I, uh, I, I have, uh, to be honest, uh, Professor, I'm, I'm truly uh, honored and uh, thank you very much for sharing your time. Despite the time over there in the UK, you have um, joined us today and um, uh, you have shared uh, a lot of your thoughts you, through your position paper. So, uh, with the kind indulgence of uh, the body, um, and also, before we go into the bill, uh, let me uh, ask um, Senator Risa for any opening statements. Uh, none, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm ready to listen as well. Salamat po. Thank you, Professor, uh, Professor Tuloy, Sen Senator Risa Ontiveros. Although you were a professor, I believe, at one point. Um, Not a full professor, just an uh, occasional instructor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Risa. And with the kind indulgence of the body, and because of the time difference in the UK and also in the States, uh, Attorney Mohamed Badisi is in DC, and the time in DC, I believe, is 8 p.m. in the morning. So with the kind indulgence of everyone, uh, we will proceed with our international resource persons because of the time difference. And uh, with that, uh, we call on Professor uh, Silke Goldberg of the Herbert Smith Free Hills um, to share her thoughts on the bill on hand. Um, to Professor, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Senator, Senators. It's uh, my pleasure and honor to be able to uh, share some thoughts on the bill that uh, you're currently debating and considering in further detail. Um, I would like, with your kind permission, perhaps outline, say, a couple of points as to background and then um, address a few points regarding the bill directly. So perhaps by, by way of background, I'm a partner in the Global Energy Practice of Herbert Smith Freehills LLP and a professor at Queen Mary University. And in the capacity as, uh, as a partner of HSF, um, I've uh, been advising first gen in relation to design of gas markets and uh, related international regulated models. I would like to thank you, all, um, in particular the Senator, for inviting me and uh, allowing me to be here as a resource speaker at this hearing. Um, my comments are largely based on my experience in European and other international jurisdictions. And the bill here is sort of, it is very much intended to assist the Senate of the Philippines by drawing on this international perspective to enhance um, the bill for the success of the gas sector in the Philippines. Um, let me first start perhaps by, just, I would like to um, comment on three on a number of particular areas. First, in relation to governance, then in relation to third party access issues as addressed in the bill, and then th thirdly, uh, in relation to stimuli or incentives, and thereafter, very briefly, uh, time permitting, in relation to transmission and transmission codes. In the first instance, um, it um, might be useful to say at the outset that my understanding of the bill is such that uh, um, large parts, sort of significant parts of the bill are effectively enabling legislation for various institutions such as the DOE, the ERC, the DNER and other governmental bodies to develop a range of policies to convene working groups and to issue RTPA permits to owners and operators of um, LNG terminals. Um, this is um, quite similar 
to what uh, we've seen in other countries and based on the experience in other countries, it's important to have clear guidelines as to competencies and accountability in place. For instance, in the European Union, in the creation of the European network codes, both the European network of transmission system operators, the Agency for Cooperation of European Energy Regulators, which is effectively um, the European Energy Regulator, as well as the European Commission, had in part overlapping competencies, which in particular at the beginning of the process led to some uh, some inefficiencies, which were eventually solved through the putting in place of a very clear framework when the relevant regulations, the network codes that then emerged, were recast. Um, also still pertaining to um, the governance uh, issues that uh, arise from the bill. Um, there is a section in relation to the licensing of LNG terminals, which goes to the mechanics in particular of section 16. That's regarding the holding of simultaneous holding of regulated TPA and own use licenses. And these mechanics are, uh, in my reading, not entirely clear. Um, so, for instance, it is not clear um, whether the dual permit that is envisaged by that section um, refers to separate LNG terminals or whether the idea is that capacity in LNG terminal can be partially reserved for the use of the operator with the remainder of the capacity being made available for public use or third party use. Um, the, latter you, the latter approach has been uh, used in European regulatory practice and if this approach were to be chosen, um, further elaboration and a bit more detail as to how the uh, coexistence of the two of the two types of capacity might coexist, uh, and that, that, that it might be useful to outline that in a little bit more detail in the act. Um, I understand, and uh, of course, I'm not a, a Philippine uh, a qualified lawyer, but I understand from. Uh, colleagues that the practice is to set this detail out in secondary legislation um, and uh, this is similar to what has happened in the European Union and here the guiding principles for such secondary legislation um, for instance in the European Union that was very much around transparency, non-discrimination uh, of users and types of license holders um, that was enacted in the primary act and then the details came in secondary legislation. Um, why am I saying all of these things in relation to governance? Because one of the experiences that comes from um, in the development of the gas sector in the European Union, but also elsewhere, is to have a clear regulatory framework for the industry in place from the outset is really important because legal certainty will encourage and assist investment in the sector. Um, I would like to make one further point in relation to the governance sector or the oversight, let's, let's call it the regulatory oversight sec uh, points in the bill, and that uh, pertains to section 5N of the bill. At the moment, this as currently drafted, <coughs> pardon, the a bill foresees that all natural gas industry participants will be required to provide to the DFE all contracts entered into including natural gas sales purchase agreements. And in the case of natural uh, natural gas transmission utilities, these are then to be provided to the ERC, uh, according to, to the reading. This is a very broad provision and creates some burdensome obligations for parties to these, to these agreements. And um, in international comparison, such a very broad disclosure, including the entire contract to be disclosed, is um, is somewhat unusual because it raises questions of commercial confidentiality. Um, <clears throat> in particular, international parties might be reluctant uh, <clears throat> to um, to. Uh, uh, we've seen similar discussions in Europe where parties then were reluctant to disclose and uh, re reluctant to initially contract with parties who had such a disclosure obligation. The, if the intention behind this is that 
uh, so as that the DFE be informed as to the market flow, the availability of gas in the local market, in particular for supply uh, security of supply uh, uh, concerns, also for competition purposes, then the um, European remit regime might be a good direct comparator. The remit regime, which is effectively a market transparency and reporting regime, means that parties to um, certain types of gas and electricity contracts, to wholesale gas and electricity contracts, have to provide core data, but not the full agreements, to a central digital platform, which in turn is run by the European Regulatory Authority, and which then contains um, additional provisions um, which prohibits um, or which prevents market abuse by market participating um, market energy participants in the energy market. Um, before, so if, um, I would like now to say a few things around third party access and the role of third party access in um, sort of in mature gas market the way that I've experienced it in uh, in particular in European markets. Um, <clears throat> Generally, um, <clears throat> TPA is of course an important facet of uh, uh, gas regulation or the gas uh, regulation and it's generally found in uh, developed gas, natural gas markets where um, often originally, often state-owned monopoly undertakings constructed, owned and operated extensive onshore gas infrastructure from the outset. In Europe, and this is in particular reflective of the histi history of the gas industry and the infrastructure it has developed over time. Um, in those jurisdictions, TPA has uh, traditionally played an important role in the liberalization process and it has in particular enabled new players to enter and uh, <clears throat> into the market and to develop, to further develop the natural gas market. As such, the um, TPA regimes can act as valuable tools in, in this process and uh, provide, promote and provide safeguards to ensure transparency and competition in the relevant market. Um, typically, jurisdictions which today enjoy successful TPA regimes had gas infrastructure in place at the time of the introduction of such regimes. Um, the hallmarks of successful TPA regimes internationally typically include a stable regulatory regime as well as an independent regulator. It's worth noting that TPA regimes usually take time to, to be established and uh, even in a bit more mature market, this is often a gradual process. Um, in, uh, in order to allow industry to adjust and to find the market design that is right for the relevant jurisdiction. That is not really a one size fit all, but <clears throat> um, this is just to say that um, these regimes take time to develop. It has taken um, the European Union three sets of legislation packages in order to arrive at the current market design in the European Union. This um, TPA as a central factor is, of course, also reflected in the bill, and in particular um, Section 18, which provides that um, an issuing an RTPA permit for an LNG terminal, um, there's a number of considerations required, amongst others, the capacity and utilization of the LNG terminal, current and future users, existing and future market conditions, um, etc. It is not clear how the views and the potential concerns of future users can be included in an assessment of uh, the capacity and utilization. Um, given that my understanding of the Philippine gas industry is it's very much a nascent industry, developing industry at this point in time. And um, it is, um, it is quite complex, therefore, whether the utilisation can cater for expected future utilisation um, in this context. Um, issues that pertain to the capacity and utilisation of the LNG terminal will be critical for any investor because this will, of course, determine the core of any commercial plans for and returns on investment. Again, as I said at the beginning here, a clear and stable regulatory regime is of particular importance. 
and um, failure to clarify the rules clearly from the outset may indeed act as a non-tariff barrier uh, for investment and ultimately hinder the successful development of the gas sector in the Philippines. Um, ultimately, the inclusion of current and future users in the consideration as, for, as to whether an RTPA permit should be issued um, is, is a complex uh, question because the decision or the um, investment as to how to develop an LNG terminal is uh, first and foremost a, a commercial decision and also with the relevant risk for the developer or investor and um, the draft bill therefore provides also for the terminal owner to uh, to set the price for access. Um, the inclusion of the capacity for current and future users has the potential to inhibit investors as the class of stakeholders that need to be included in the assessment of the capacity is not clearly defined. It might lead to, to a situation where the decision to issue an RTPA permit might be subject to future competitors' views and without such competitors having to actually invest anything, but um, they will have the potential to stifle the investment and damage the development of the gas sector as a result. Um, RTPA also plays a role in relation to the natural gas transmission system in the bill and uh, effectively the bill proposes to create a public natural gas transmission system on the basis of legislative franchise. Again, understand from Philippine qualified uh, uh, legal colleagues that that would involve primary legislation in addition to the other permits, so the, in addition to the own use permit and the RTPA permit. Um, and that would be required pursuant to sections 21 and 22 of the bill. In if primary legislation were to be required, this might create hurdles for obtaining um, such concessions and also for future amendments of such con concessions. Um, it also imports by its very nature political risk into the process from the investor's perspective. I have um, also some concerns about around the timing that is involved um, as it might take a significant amount of time to develop the relevant legislation which could have the potential to delay projects for a number of years. In the upstream sector in particular I've often seen issues arising from an approach that uses primary legislation for concessions or franchise such as for instance a very long and complex process um, but also difficulties in amending a franchise when new circumstances arise. Um, the perhaps very brief comment on the natural transmission fee. This is to consist, according to the bill, to consist of amounts used to defray the cost of planning, constructing, um, improving, expanding, maintaining and abandoning the system, as well as the cost of operating and performing the functions of a natural gas transmission system operator. This does not include um, any reference to return on investment, which however is something that we would uh, ordinarily expect to uh, to see in, in, in such a context, which uh, is a reasonable of commercial consideration for investors wishing to invest in, in any gas sector um, internationally. Which leads me to the next section of my comments, which pertain to incentives or stimuli. In the case of the European Union, uh, in order to encourage um, more LNG terminals and indeed gas interconnectors, so um, uh, gas pipelines connecting to European jurisdictions. Uh, various stimuli and incentives have been made available for new infrastructure projects in the energy sector. In the EU, the concept of legislative franchise for gas infrastructure is not used and the incentives I'm describing in my comments here are not predicated on such a mechanism. Um, for instance, in the European Union for certain types of regulated European 
uh, projects of common interests. So these are projects of particular interest and benefit to the whole European internal market. There is, for instance, the possibility of enhanced tariffs, which are intended to provide incentives for pro projects with a particular risk profile. Other incentives might include um, the authorization to use long-term primary capacity for anchor clients or shareholders. So this would be own use capacity in the language of the Philippine uh, legislation. And uh, these incentives are available on application uh, in Europe. On the basis of the experience uh, I've seen in Europe, um, it might be helpful therefore to consider in order to encourage investment in the Philippine gas sector, um, that appropriate incentives might be made available so that the risks that are associated with large infrastructure projects and LNG terminals and gas infrastructure um, the systems are, of course, very large infrastructure projects so that the risk can be adequately addressed and to allow investors to develop the necessary infrastructure for the future um, on a stable and attractive regulatory basis. Um, just perhaps a very quick word on, on timing. Um, it is my understanding that the, uh, the bill provides for an inclusion of LNG terminals in an annual investment priorities plan, as well as the incentives provided under Executive Order 226 of uh, 16th of July 1987. And uh, there are various incentives arising from that to encourage the construction and operation of LNG terminals. My understanding is that uh, as currently drafted, the bill provides for a time limit for these incentives for six years. Um, based on the experience in Europe with quite comparable regimes, um, it has been shown that this is not a very long period of time in this context, even though it feels like that. Um, perhaps sort of uh, when you stand at the beginning of, uh, uh, of, of a particular project. Um, in particular, if this, this period of six years is to cover the development and construction phase of a relevant LNG terminal. Um, for instance, the comparative timelines in Europe are, there are certain conditions for the availability for certain types of incentives. And here the timelines are that they have to commence construction um, within two years of the relevant incentive decisions having been made available and five years for constructions. The problem with that is that projects that have had the benefit of such an incentive decision often have to request extensions because it usually takes longer for very large projects such as LNG terminals and gas transmission projects. Um, so just sort of a comment from, from the European perspective that um, um, the timescales are important in that context. Um, perhaps sort of uh, from the timescale point in relation to the incentive regime, uh, a quick point on transmission and transmission codes. I note that section six of the bill provides for the establishment of a natural gas transmission code within one year from the entry into force of the act or the bill the triennial review period. Mm -hmm. Again, on, against the backdrop of the European Union experience with the development of the reasonably narrow European Union network codes, um, they have often taken much more than 12 months for each of these codes. Now, in the European Union, you could say, okay, you have many different stakeholders who need to be consulted. Um, but also in relation to, for instance, to the British Uniform Network Code, which is effectively the um, gas grid code for uh, Great Britain, amendments to the Uniform Network Code can take several months alone. Um, the bill, as I understand it, does not currently foresee a framework in which um, the relevant bodies could rely on drawing up a transmission code. In the European Union, um, the situation was originally envisaged in a similar fashion, but um, the legislators in the European Union then introduced parameters for the network codes, 
um, to be considered and to be translated into the relevant network codes. So, for instance, in relation to transparency, non-discrimination, etc., and similar principles. Um, so, as such, the European network codes have each been pre uh, preceded by detailed preparatory works on guidelines for the future code with consultations for the relevant stakeholders before work on the actual codes begun. And uh, the net mechanism for these guidelines was set out in the relevant EU uh, regulation. Um, I think um, I have probably made all the points that um, I uh, wanted to make in this context. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senators, I am at your disposal for any further questions. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much for the very detailed uh, presentation of your comments and uh, of your position paper. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Senator Hontiveras if she has any uh, clarification, any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I did make a note of. Well, I took notes of uh, Professor Silka's presentation and it, uh, also made note of her comments about an independent regulator that I'd like to ask follow-up questions about. But maybe later, Mr. Chairman, I can wait until after our um, other international resource person shall have made his presentation. I can wait, Mr. Chairman. Salamat. Thank you, Senator Antiveros. And uh, with the permission of uh, Professor Silke, uh, would like to also call on uh, Attorney uh, Mohamed Badisi, another um, um, expert in the uh, realm of um, natural gas, and he's a member of the U.S. Department of Commerce, and who's who's been also uh, doing a lot of workshops, a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, seminars here in the Philippines, capacitating different government agencies uh, in terms of um, the natural gas industry. So uh, we call on uh, Attorney Mohamed Badisi. Thank you very much, Senator. I think before I, I provide a, a brief overview of our comments, I'd like to defer to uh, Attorney Sue Logan, who directs our, our broad portfolio programs in Southeast Asia to provide some opening remarks. Uh, Sue? Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you clear, loud Great. and clear. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, we wish to thank the Senate Committee on Energy um, and the Office of Senator Gachalian for allowing CLDP to be an ongoing resource as you develop legislation to govern the midstream and eventually the downstream natural gas sectors in the Philippines. Um, we have greatly enjoyed the years of collaboration we've engaged in with the Senate Committee on Energy, the Gas Policy Development Project, and the Department of Energy. Um, Mohammed, more so than myself, I, I joined CLDP in January and really look forward to continuing to work with, with you all. Um, so CLDP's comments today are made with the support of the U.S. Embassy in Manila and the United States Department's Bureau of Energy, Re uh, Bureau of Energy Resources under its Program for Technical Advisory Services on Hydrocarbon Sector Governance, uh, which is the Energy and Government Governance Capacity Initiative and in support of the Asia Enhancing Development and Growth through Energy or Asia Edge Initiative of the United States Government. Um, I just wanted to provide some brief um, introductory remarks before um, passing the torch back over to uh, Mr. Mohammed Bidisi for some um, more uh, more in-depth comments on some of the, the areas of the legislation that may um, need a little bit uh, more um, discussion. But we will keep our comments brief as we know that Professor Goldberg is um, is is quite late in her day. Um, so first, we just wanted to really um, commend the Senate Committee on Energy and, and the drafters and um, legislative aides and, and attorneys who have been working on this this bill um, since reviewing it in in June of this of this past year. Um, we noticed um, that you know par paragraphs were reorganized, language was clarified, and you could really tell that the the legislation was thoroughly scrubbed to make sure d uh, defined terms were clear and consistent throughout that allocations of responsibility as between um, each regulatory agency um, were, um, there was a strong attempt to define those clearly and delineate those um, uh, in, a, in a logical manner and um, that prohibited acts were spelled, uh, spelled out in a comprehensive manner. We think all of these are great additions to the legislation. 
Um, our, hand, our handwritten comments that we provided in um, December do provide um, a small list of some additional clarifications and cleanup suggestions if, if, that, if um, you find those to be helpful. I think Professor Goldberg did mention a few of those as well. Um, from, and then on a substantive perspective, um, we um, really commend you and think that it's a great, um, it, it's, a, it's a good choice to sort of focus right now on the midstream, um, the midstream sector and leaving the downstream sector for future legislation. Um, I think there's different considerations between the two. Um, and I think that, you know, it really, in order to drive investment in, in the Philippines in the upstream and midstream sectors, focusing on this now and then, you know, following up soon thereafter, with the, with the downstream legislation will really sort of help move things along in that regard. Um, and of course, CLDP is, is, is um, excited and would love to help um, be a resource on that legislation when, when you take that up. Um, on the open access and RTPA provisions that Professor Goldberg spent some time on, um, we did see from the June 2020 version significant progress as well, um, that it looks like there have been strong efforts since that time to sort of strengthen and clarify um, the own use and RTPA provisions, um, which are quite complicated, which are sort of the most consequential pieces of the legislation, of course. Um, and we do, in our, in our written comments, we do provide some um, additional uh, suggestions to further improve those sections. I will turn it over to my colleague, um, Mohamed Badisi, to um, elaborate on that a little bit further and get into some of our other, um, some of the other comments that we had. Uh, thank you, Sue. And again, uh, thank you to, to the Senator and to the full committee for, for allowing us to share uh, some comments today. I, I would just echo uh, what my colleague said that, you know, we, we've had the pleasure and honestly, the, the, really the honor uh, of working with both the Senate, um, the Department of Energy, uh, and other bodies within the Philippines government on the entire project uh, to bring LNG, to reform the gas market, um, and to create a, a new investment space in the Philippines. And, and I want to note, um, as Sue said, that I, I think the progress has been considerable. Um, our comments today are offered in the spirit of a perspective that we're very close to what should be a workable framework law. I think uh, Professor Goldberg said it well, and it's worth restating that the job as we see it, and our experience in the US, and I think the experience in Europe is the same, is that your the framework legislation should be sufficiently detailed to set out the questions, but not necessarily the answers, which is to say that it should detail what elements of a natural gas market must be defined for the predictability for investors, for the security, say energy security, you know, for stability of supply. But much of the details, much of the answers to those questions will come out in implementing legislation, will come out in the deliberations of everybody from the energy regulator to the Department of Energy to even the Philippines you know, Competition Commission, for example. And that's where much of the specific guidance will come about. So uh, I think uh, as a government employee myself, I understand very well the burden of creating policy because it's never perfect. Um, and the pursuit of perfection is a pursuit of failure, as we say. Um, but I think we, we genuinely see that the progress that has been made with the bill is, is approaching that point where the Senate should be comfortable with passing the law with the expectation that there's still work to be done after that framework uh, is in place. I'll, I'll make a few comments now, um, as my colleague said, we'll try and keep them brief on areas that could um, benefit from a bit more clarity at, from a framework legislation perspective where you know the, the specific authority should be more closely defined. Let me start first with the shift uh, from the previous edition of the law to this current version of removing um, regulation of downstream regulations. Um, and I think this has been echoed by others already. Uh, we believe that is a, a productive change that is a, an appropriate uh, amendment to the bill, specifically because the philosophy of regulation for midstream is fundamentally different than the regulation of a downstream market. A downstream market typically is focused on regulating fixed monopolies, uh, where the uh, you know the concern is about protecting consumers from monopoly behavior, but also creating sufficient uh, you know investment incentives for somebody to, to make that large capital investment up front uh, and recover their investment over time. Typically, midstream regulation is more focused on boundaries for a marketplace. The actors in the midstream, project developers, gas buyers, and everybody else in between, 
tend to be more sophisticated, that tend to be um, entities that don't require as much constrained or sort of prescriptive regulation. But nevertheless, I think as Professor Goldberg said, they do require predictability. They require sufficient guidance to know what are the rules of the marketplace? What are the expectations once a project is constructed? What the operational parameters will be? And what are their you know, expectations for recovery? How can they actually charge the fees that are necessary to recover their investment and make a return at the end of the day? And I think uh, in its current form, uh, the removal of the downstream regulation is, is appropriate. Um, and the philosophy that has been adopted, and, and Senator, I think you said this at the very output, the, the philosophy of, of structuring a marketplace where there's sufficient guidance and protection of both the public interest and the investor interest, but leaving enough space within the marketplace for some experimentation, uh, for some um, opportunity for innovation by investors um, is the right way to go forward. And as I'll mention in a few other areas, uh, we think that that's a, a healthy uh, regulatory balance that should be preserved in the law uh, going forward. One last note on the competition between you know, midstream regulation uh, and downstream regulation. It is, as a pure legislative drafting exercise, sometimes helpful to reserve the space for downstream regulation, which is to say, and we've had this experience in the US, we had a, we had a problem in the US whereby there was a distance between our downstream regulation, which was typically done at a state level, and our midstream regulation, which was typically done at the federal level since it crossed state borders. That caused a lot of headaches in the US. And the reason for that is that since the two systems weren't integrated from the outset, sometimes it wasn't clear where the two boundaries, where the two regulatory you know, um, laws intersected and where they worked together or potentially even conflicted. Even though downstream regulation has been removed from the law, a definition that it will be later promulgated and that that downstream regulation must comply with the you know the parameters of this midstream law or some other language that makes clear the the sharing of authority that will have to happen at some point uh, could be helpful just as a reservation of authority perhaps a reservation for a doe erc or others to begin that investigation and at some point that you know downstream regulation would become uh, its own law uh, as well so that's just one uh, specific structural note a strategic note i think the the two key issues that we wanted to discuss today uh, are the concept of third party access. Um, and then finally, the sort of the investor sentiment or uh, we, the mix of issues around standards and investor expectations. Starting with third party access, I, I think Professor Goldberg provided an excellent overview. There's significant literature on this. Uh, I'll turn to my colleague, uh, you know, Sue Logan in a moment, because we've actually worked on this very same question of third party access in a few other countries in the region already. So. We feel very familiar with it, but I want to make a strategic observation up front. Third party access in most markets is a efficiency question. It's a question of encouraging efficient use of installed infrastructure. Another way to say that is third party access creates a pathway by which a terminal, which may not be operating at, at full capacity, that remaining capacity, that unused capacity can be made available to the marketplace and maximum utility can be extracted from that installed infrastructure. That's typically the focus uh, of third party access. It's sort of a market efficiency and it introduces some elements of competition and liquidity and liberalization. We do want to note, however, that there are additional concerns in the Philippines and, and with respect, and, and we know that this has been a, a conversation uh, at both the Senate level and the DOE level, that one of the challenges in the Philippines is an energy security question, which is to say that as Malampaya, uh, the reservoir Malampaya is depleted further and, and that essential source of natural gas supply is no longer a predictable source of supply in the Philippines. As a matter of energy security, given that natural gas continues to supply, you know, 20, 30, you know, or more percent of the energy supply, the security of supply, the, the confidence in knowing that at any point in time, gas will be available to continue you know, producing electricity is an energy security question in addition to a market question. And so as you continue to structure the third party access rules, some reservation or, or some clear definition of authority by which the DOE, ERC and others can put out two sets of rules. One set of third party access rules that function as a market efficiency regime. And I think that's been the focus of Professor Goldberg's comments and the, the focus of much of our comments in our paper as well. 
And that's around the expectations for, you know, when uh, access is, is mandated, how the permits would be issued. Uh, as we noted in our, in our paper, a regular review period by which to determine whether or not the access actually has been provided you know, on an open market basis or there have been some sort of, uh, you know, um, let's say self-dealing or other forms of inappropriate activity going on in the marketplace. One question on the third party access that the law does very well now is defining um, the market rules. And that can be clarified, but I think that's essential and it's in the law now. The additional question of energy security, which is to say, when can the regulator determine that a, a terminal may be inefficiently used and that represents a security concern to the marketplace? That represents a security of supply concern to the marketplace. That's an additional authority that's not clear in the law at the moment. And it's not an essential part of third party access regimes in other countries, because typically they have alternative sources of supply. In Europe, you have pipelines. And in the US, we have both pipelines and LNG and you know, native sources, uh, et cetera. So that, that security issue is essential. And the way that it can be addressed, and we've noted this in our paper, and I think um, others have said this as well, is through a, a healthy disclosure regime. I think Professor Goldberg mentioned the, the, the challenges around disclosure of contracts, but generally some disclosure uh, of purchase and sale agreements is typical in a marketplace, some level of disclosure, maybe not the entire contract. The other question that's going to be essential for the regulators in the Philippines and should be uh, clearly delineated in the law is the ability of regulators to require disclosure about fundamental data on the operations, the supply, the availability, and other activity in the natural gas marketplace. Another way to say that is the posture at the outset of this new natural gas market that is being structured through the law, it should be a learning posture for the government. And the best way to ensure that the regulator and others are able to build out a sophisticated understanding of natural gas supply and security issues and modeling you know, future demand, et cetera, is through sufficient disclosure of data, information, and other activity to build out that knowledge of the marketplace. And the reason that's important at a legislative level is that typically, and this has been our experience in the US, and I'll defer uh, as others have that I'm not a, a Philippines qualified lawyer, but the ability to mandate disclosures is typically a, a, an authority that has to be defined in law in the US. Otherwise, the assumption is that most data is private, that most transactional data is private. Um, and so I think a balance can be struck, and I really do want to be sensitive to the comments made by Professor Goldberg, and I'm sure they're, they're elsewhere um, in, in the, the comments that are received by the Senate. A, a burdensome disclosure regime does become a disincentive to investment. It becomes a cost, a cost that can burden projects. But an informed disclosure regime actually becomes a benefit to all market actors because the early investors in the marketplace know that they are educating the government on how best to operate the market. And the government is able to capture the insight in the marketplace that makes it better able to efficiently and predictably manage the market over time. And so disclosure, if properly structured, can be beneficial to all parties. And I'll leave this point uh, you know, on the question of, of, of disclosure. It's a conversation typically in most marketplaces. What we've done in the US and other countries we've seen as well, a conversation is had with industry asking the simple question of what are you comfortable disclosing? And more importantly, in what format? Is it quarterly? Is it under a standardized you know, data disclosure system? Financial data, for example, in the US is heavily structured. We have mandated templates and other you know, disclosure mechanisms, but other forms of disclosure, you know, say you know, uh, mechanical safety, other data tends to be on a proprietary basis. I'll leave it at this. I don't wanna go into too much detail, but that authority to mandate disclosure should be clear in the law, I would, argue, however, that the form of disclosure, what should be disclosed and how, is probably best left to an implementing regulation that is developed in partnership with industry, in conversation with industry. Uh, and Sue, let me just pause here because I think, you know, our experience in, in Vietnam and elsewhere might be helpful just about how we've seen other countries develop third-party access regimes over time, that they did require some time to mature. I don't know if you want to make any comments there. Sure. sure up too much time but I just wanted to say that we have um, we are um, we've looked into the sort of third party access experience in both Thailand and Malaysia um, both of which countries have um, 
we'll call it a working, it's, it may not be by all accounts robust third party access regime yet, um, but it is, you know, there are, have, there have been licenses um, issued and cargoes um, shipped and delivered. And, and, um, and so we've looked at, bo at both cases and what we found is that, um, and these are just sort of broad stroke um, things to keep in mind with respect to third party access. And I think they echo what Professor Goldberg also said about the European experience is that this this um, transition, um, well, it's it's normally a transition rather than an institution from the get go in a new in a new sort of um, industry. So there is that to bear in mind. And, and Professor Goldberg said this as well. It's it's typically sort of um, a robust sort of working monopolistic um, market in which these third party access is introduced. Um, in Thailand and Malaysia, that was also the case. And, but, um, I think in terms of, um, you know, seeing what they've done over the last, say, 20 years with it, you see that, um, like in the, in the EU, where I think it took three rounds to sort of get there, um, they each, in each case in Thailand and Malaysia, they've taken sort of steps towards um, steps towards liberalization, steps towards third party access that have been sometimes successful, sometimes unsuccessful. And um, so I think it's just important to keep in mind, we can, you know, if, if and to the extent those examples of sort of what exactly they tried and what, you know, what, um, how that worked and what didn't work, um, if that's of interest to the Senate um, Committee on Energy, um, or anyone on this call, we can sort of make that available and even dig more into details um, as well, um, just to sort of get more exemplars to sort of look at um, to what to do and what not to do. And I'll, I'll uh, and, and thank you, Sue. I think, and, and we've shared some of those other examples in, in the paper and we're happy to provide more detail going forward. I'll just close with, with two more uh, comments, general comments that I, that I hope were helpful. And, uh, always happy to take uh, questions. The, the the third comment that we'd like to share is the notion of competition and really how that philosophy of competition should be defined under the law. Uh, we noted in our paper a few areas where, you know, for example, whether it's terminal fees or I think the idea of, of you know, transmission tariffs, other uh, forms of costs, other forms of, you know, charges um, in the marketplace and how those may trigger competition concerns. We want to make just one very simple point. Uh, competition generally is an outcome rather than a requirement in a marketplace. What we mean by that is that, generally speaking, the market matures over time, the dynamics of a market change. And in the US, we have seasonal changes, we have daily changes in our market dynamics. But competition is something we define under our regulations as a sufficient amount of oversight, activity, and clarity in the marketplace that all actors, buyers, sellers, and regulators are comfortable in, in agreeing that the marketplace is open, it's competitive, and that there's real price discovery at the end of the day. And what that means, you know, from a, from a competition philosophy is that at a legislative level, especially at a framework legislative level, like the law that's before us today, it's important that the law mandate oversight and that who, whatever the oversight authority is, have competition as an outcome in mind, that they're seeking competition in the marketplace. But it's also important to avoid rigidity in trying to define how competition would take place. For example, when it comes to something as simple as pricing, you know, terminal fees or transportation fees, regasification, to say that, uh, you know, a, a terminal uh, operator may not offer preferential rates to an affiliated entity, on its face seems like a clear um, effort to increase competition and reduce monopolistic behavior. And that in most cases it is, but that's most cases. Uh, at an early stage in the marketplace, a significant amount of the supply and the sales of gas may be amongst affiliated entities because early on in project development, the project developer has to be confident that there's sufficient buyers, off takers. So there may be a consortium of buyers, it may be only affiliated entities, even with a, you know, a regulated third party access terminal, it may be primarily consortium um, partners who are buying the gas and that shouldn't be a prohibited activity and a discounting of that gas may not be prohibited early on in the marketplace because that discount creates the incentive to sign the contract that justifies the construction of the terminal in the first place. All this is to say is very simply that defining competition as, as, a, as a necessary output, that it's a requirement for a healthy marketplace, empowering uh, regulators and others to, to monitor and, and support competition, those are essential activities in the law. We would 
suggests reducing certain prohibitions, for example, uh, mandatory auctions for RTPAs. Again, that should be a default, perhaps, but a regulator can determine that perhaps early on in the market development, that's not necessary yet. Some flexibility in how to produce competition is helpful because competition is harder to achieve at an early stage in the market because there are fewer actors but it can be produced more effectively over time as the market matures and the competition authority and the competition philosophy matures with the market. Uh, and then finally, you know, one other area where we would encourage a, a bit more flexibility, and this is an, another government to government sharing of, of you know, experiences here. We in the US struggled for years with the setting of standards, technical operating safety and other standards, even accounting standards um, in the energy marketplace. And this is for a number of reasons. You know, the U.S. Is, is a funny place. You know, we're one country, but we have 50 states, and each one of our 50 states has 50 sets of rules when it comes to, you know, technical standards. And sometimes even within a state, you know, in Texas, you can drive 10 miles and there's a different, you know, oil well standard, and then another 10 miles is another standard. All this is to say is that uh, we have struggled in the U.S. to keep up with the industry when it comes to standard setting. We are constantly catching up to the sophistication and the innovation that's happening from everything from new materials to new standard operating procedures to, to new design standards uh, in the industry. And we learned a lesson, I think, you know, sort of in the, in the 80s and 90s, and it's really been enshrined in the last 20 years in the US, that it's better to view standard setting as a government adoption rather than a government creation activity. What that means is rather than mandating as it currently exists in the law, that a particular agency shall create standards for X, fire safety, gas quality, whatever it may be. We instead have empowered our agencies in the US to adopt standards that may have been created by others. You know, for example, primarily in the technical space, but also in the accounting space as well, uh, we use what are called standards developing organizations, SDOs. These are industry bodies whereby the committees are set up they have representatives of industry, the academia, and the U.S. government. We sit on these committees ourselves, and they develop standards. A very famous one, are, you know, for example, fire safety standards for LNG terminals. The industry develops a standard. It's based upon actual practice in the industry, and then the U.S. government reviews the standard and adopts it as law through what we call incorporation by reference. We actually reference the standard in our regulations. The U.S. government now applies standard X Y Z, you know, developed by a standards developing organization. To be very honest with you, it's a lot easier and it's a lot cheaper at the end of the day. And it's a lot faster, too. It reduces the necessity that the U.S. government be an expert in a particular area of operations, accounting or oversight. And instead, it allows us to become an observer of industry practice and adopting that practice. But again, we, we sit on those committees. We have a hand in the creation of the standard, but it doesn't have to happen in-house. Um, and that has been productive in a couple of different ways. One is, um, and this is, was not clear at the outset, but it's become clear over time, by adopting industry standards, it's easier to hold industry accountable. Because when you hold industry accountable to the standards that they created, it's less likely that they can complain that the standards are ambiguous, unclear, or unworkable. And so I, even in, in, in the litigation and in other situations, we found that using industry standards has a lot of benefits in terms of avoiding um, non-compliance in the industry. That's one. And second of all, it encourages innovation. Uh, the government is never behind. It's always alongside industry. And as industry develops, and, and I would encourage you to consider the fact that the Philippines may become one of the best laboratories for liquefied natural gas utilization in the world, because already you're, you're expecting to use gas imports or gas in general uh, as an energy supply. But the fact that it's an island nation and the distributed nature of gas, whether maybe, you know, uh, you know, we even have in the U.S. now where we're shipping gas by container, it could be LNG as a marine fuel, which is a major possibility, and the Philippines LNG fuels, except, uh, LNG uh, transportation, etc. I think the amount of innovation that's likely to take place in the Philippines is significant. And the best philosophy by which the government can support and facilitate that innovation is that that partnership you know, approach to standards as opposed to that creation of standards approach that was typical in the U.S. and I think is, is uh, typical in many countries still in the U.S., but uh, many other countries in the world, but we've sort of moved beyond it through experience uh, here. I'll pause there and make one last point, uh, which is to simply say that the general approach under the law of establishing market space, but allowing private actors to both 
take the risk of development, which is a significant risk, but then also be the operational uh, and other actors is important and should be preserved. I, I, I mean this as a compliment and I mean this as something that should be really defended during the further legislative process. There is sometimes uh, a concern and a, a typical orientation when you're drafting legislation for more government oversight. And we've had this experience in the US and, and I think we've seen this in other markets. Uh, and I, I truly mean this as a compliment, the, the legislation as drafted now has a very healthy balance of oversight and self-regulation by industry. And that's something we struggled for years with in the US and we had to arrive to at this point. And I think that the Philippines has the benefit of starting, you know, learning from the mistakes of other markets ahead of time. That balance should be preserved going forward. Uh, and I think if it is sufficiently preserved and, and you're able to maintain uh, this regulatory philosophy, you will have established one of the most predictable, but also one of the most open gas markets in Southeast Asia. And frankly, I would even say, you know, in emerging markets around the world. And I think it's a commendable, um, you know, choice. I really want to, you know, as somebody who's been working on this for years and has had the pleasure of seeing the evolution, the commitment to fostering investment um, is clear in the law, uh, should be maintained, and will really be a very productive and attractive feature uh, of the market uh, going forward. Let me pause there, uh, Sue. Uh, any any uh, final comments before we we hand back the the floor? No, I think you captured everything well. Well, again, thank you, Senator, for the time. Uh, you know, we we remain committed to 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 this process as being a resource going forward, uh, and we thank you for the time today. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Attorney Vidisi and uh, Attorney Logan. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, I have a few questions, but I'll uh, uh, ask um, Santo Hontiveros for her questions first, and then we can proceed uh, asking the two uh, international experts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I actually just have about a couple of clarificatory questions each to um, Professor Silke and uh, Attorney Badisi, and I hope Attorney Sue might also have some comments on my uh, seeking of uh, clarifications. Um, maybe I'll just present them all together, uh, Mr. Chair, and then ask our three resource persons if they'd care to comment on any of them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Chair, and I do hope to ask these of our Philippine resource persons as well later in the hearing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I first took note of Professor Silke's um, cautionary, seemingly cautionary words about confidentiality. And um, listening later to uh, attorney Badisi's comments about disclosure um just as an outsider and as, as a first impression it it seemed that um maybe the 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 european perspective uh that i heard as i understood it from um professor silke uh um uh leaned more on the side of confidentiality Whereas the, maybe the American experience, as I seem to understand from Attorney Badisi, uh, leaned more on the side of disclosure. I don't know if this is a correct uh, impression, um, but it's important for me to ask Mr. Chair because we always want to learn from the best practices and you know um, models in, in other countries um, as well. And I'm interested in this issue because uh, I want, looking at our bill now, um, I want to learn if confidentiality provisions might not become unnecessarily broad. After all, the power sector is of vital interest to the public and aren't power contracts and other related materials, uh, public documents as well. So I'm interested to um, have specificity about what propri proprietary and confidential data uh, might be withheld from the public. Uh, my second um clarification would be on well i found it uh, interesting attorney badisi's comments about um upstream regulation having more to do with consumer protection and midstream regulation such as we're considering now in the bill having to do more with boundaries for the marketplace because it seems like the two um interests would actually flow into each other um wouldn't for example mid midstream regulation um, providing boundaries as it will for the marketplace also in fact 
or should should it not in fact also provide for consumer pr uh, protection you know in a in a in a symbiotic way um and then i was very interested in professor silkes um inputs about an independent regulator uh, particularly because i want to ask mr chairman questions about the possibility of um this our bill uh inserting a provision requiring an independent ngtso an independent um, natural gas transmission system operator so uh, I'd, I'd appreciate any comments about that as well from professor silke um, as well as from our two other resource persons, if they'd care to, to make such comments. Salamat, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our resource persons. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Risa. And uh, we'll let um, Professor Silke to go first and uh, answer your queries. And then after that, uh, we'll uh, allow uh, Prof, uh, Attorney Badisi and Attorney Logan to comment also. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much, Senator Hontiveros, for your questions. Um, let me try and answer the question pertaining to confidentiality and disclosure first. Um, I actually think the European system, which is under a regulation for um, the integrity of, it's called a wholesale market, energy market integrity and transparency, or also shortly referred to as REMIT, um, it's eff effectively a compromise. Um, under that regime, parties need to disclose the volume, the price, the parties to the actual contract, um, certain um, sh sometimes gas contracts can be shaped in a particular type, um, not so much for electricity contracts, but basically any type of options or any relevant features that would pertain to um, supply security, but also that uh, any competition authority might be interested in ex post facto. Mm. However, what is not disclosed is the whole contract. Uh -huh. It's also disclosed on an anonymized basis. So it's effectively uploaded into a, a digital portal to mm. ESA, the European regulator. And um, so, but obviously if you have the, the core data, that doesn't mean that you can reconstruct the contract, which might be quite sensitive. So if a particular company has certain views as to they always draft their clauses as to, I don't know, liability or penalties or whatever it might be under various jurisdictions um, laws um, in a particular way, that is not disclosed. It is mm -hmm. the core data so that the regulator can be satisfied they have the information they need to ensure market integrity, but mm -hmm. it doesn't go beyond that threshold. Um, there were concerns in Europe about this and, uh, because um, market participants did feel that this was going quite far because um, as I heard from from somebody, uh, I think it was uh, Attorney Badisi just before, uh, Attorney Logan um, just before, about the at the point in which trading regulation or certain regulations had been introduced in the United States. Actually, in the European Union, up until 2011, there was no European Union level legislation as to trade at all. Hmm. So, um, there was a sort of, it was um, only after considerations about market integrity and market regulation that this was introduced in the first instance. Um, mm -hmm. So it's quite late in the day, perhaps. And mm -hmm. uh, again, sort of against the backdrop of liberalization in Europe has started in at some point in the 80s. So mm -hmm. with over, well, at that point, 30 years of a liberalized market without trading regulation, parties were very reluctant. <laughs> However, um, the the regime as such has worked reasonably well. Um, um, they, in addition, what the regime also does in Europe, it provides, um, it prohibits certain practices which were reasonably widespread, um, which are more relevant for developed intraday markets. So, for instance, um, high frequency trading to create fake transactions um, and it's that sort of it's, it's the sort of um, insider trading scenarios you might know from stockbroking or from the stock markets now the European Union market has that effectively for energy markets for both gas and electricity markets um, 
So that the remit regulation has two parts to it. So first of all, it's the disclosure part within a certain sort of, uh, framework. And then there's the market abuse prevention, mm -hmm. which goes again, goes to transparency. Thank you. Um, then I think the next question was in relation to the independent regulator. Um, my comment really grew again against the backdrop that in the European Union, um, and I have to say I cannot possibly comment on the Philippine situation because um, I, uh, I'm simply not qualified in your jurisdiction, so I, would, I wouldn't know how well. Uh, um, but um, in Europe what happened was that very originally when liberalisation happened, there was no need for a regulator because very often the big energy entities were state-owned. Mm. So um, you had vertically integrated monopolies. So once the vertically integrated monopolies were unbundled, then um, you needed a market coordinator, market regulator. Um, and initially that was often done within the ministry and depending on who the minister of the day was, they might overrule that relevant department and take different decisions. And that's why in the process of the liberalisation and integration of the European market, specific rules were created for an independent regulator. Mm -hmm. So that is different from the concept of um, the pipeline operator or the gas transmission line operator, which is again, it's, it's a separate concept, but that was the European backdrop, and that's uh, it's perhaps more for historical relevance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we turn over the uh, floor to uh, um, Attorney Badisi and Attorney Sue, um, Attorney Badisi is absolutely correct. Uh, disclosure is really a sensitive matter here in the Philippines. Uh, since we deregulated our uh, downstream oil industry, uh, there was uh, actually the law, the deregulation law, was not uh, clear on what aspects should be disclosed to the government. In fact, it became a source of litigation between the mm -hmm. private oil companies and government. And mm -hmm. government lost in terms of... Uh, uh, requiring the private uh, companies to disclose and to unbundle their um, uh, their their, con their contracts. Mm -hmm. So it's good that these points uh, were raised by uh, Tony Bedisi and of course Senator Hontiveros because we want to make sure that there is a healthy balance in the law uh, in terms of disclosures, in terms of unbundling, just to make sure that the consumers at the end of the day it's really for the consumers it's just to make sure that we are giving the best prices to the consumers and the uh, competition is vibrant and healthy uh, especially in the midstream industry so uh, we turn over the floor to um, attorney sue and attorney logan and we can pursue that topic because striking that balance is very difficult in fact uh, even when we were drafting this law uh, we know for a fact that uh, our private um, uh, uh, proponents are quite uh, wary about uh, disclosing commerciality of their um, of their uh, products, and uh, I would like to also know how to strike that right balance. You know? And uh, I would like to also ask um, Tony Bedisi and Tony Logan uh, what components. In terms of unbundling, what components should we put in the law so that we will have enough information that competition is vibrant and rich in the industry? All right, one second. I'm just taking a quick note. Um, so thank you so much for the questions. Um, on just a quick note, the disclosure point. I think um, from our perspective, um, the law, I think, being a little bit broader in the implement in the in the enabling legislation, to say that the um, that the relevant regulatory agency can require disclosure of contracts, can require um, disclosure of data, I think is is necessary, and it, I think it's um, it's good to have in there understanding that um, private the private sector participants will be um, a little bit. Um, nervous about what that means. Um, and I think that's where the implementing regulations can really um, 
come to come to um, spell out what the requirements are, how contract how the contracts will be disclosed. Um, oftentimes in in the U.S., um, a full contract is required to be disclosed, but um, whether it's commercially sensitive information, proprietary information, commercially sensitive um, pricing information, however you however you sort of slice it and dice it and sort of give give the private sector participants the chance to redact um, before they disclose, um, so that those so that those pieces aren't subject to disclosure at all. Um, I think the key there is to um, really sort of when when the regulator start to um, go into the legislative or the regulatory effort to build the regulations. It's really understanding what do we want, what do we need to know in order to foster and grow this market efficiently and to promote competition and to um, sort of achieve the outcomes we seek to achieve with respect to this market. What information do we need um, in order to do that? What information is that, you know, w about these commercial transactions would not would not be relevant to us. I, you know, asking for irrelevant information is always going to sort of put you in a bad stead with the private, the private sector. Um, and so it's really getting down to what information do we need? Um, and at the end of the day, either allowing for its redaction um, and in a full in a full um, delivery of a contract, or um, as Professor Goldberg mentioned, having some sort of um, uh, sort of database style input system where that information and only that information can be um, can be input. Um, so I think that's the sort of the difference here in striking the balance is really to um, mm -hmm. in the legislation, you know, give the regulatory authorities the opportunity to request disclosure and to and to have disclosure, but then to really drill down with, within those regulatory agencies, what do we need and what don't we need? Um, and what can we sort of, how can we regulate this market appropriately and, and help create the market and foster the market without, um, you know, without hindering uh, commercial transactions? Um, so I think that was on the first point. Um, the second question um, Senator Hontiveros had mentioned um, was sort of trying to understand um, the extent to which midstream regulation, doesn't it also affect commercial consumer protection um, in the same way that, that downstream regulations do? Um, and from the way I see it is that um, the midstream regulations legislation and to my mind is sort of it is it does relate to consumer protection it is intended to help promote consumer protection but because consumers if you look at just the midstream sector consumers aren't really an actor the the mm -hmm. goal there then is to make sure you have a fair and competitive market at the end of the day you know it may take some time to build that but you have a fair and competitive market which will itself enable prices to be competitive for consumers in the interest of in the interest of consumers um, whereas downstream regulation where consumers are directly affected it has much more of a sort of a traditional sort of consumer protected protection bent to it um, and that I think is the difference that um, attorney but was was trying to get at but I will because it was his point that he made I will of course let him <laughs> respond <laughs> Attorney Badisi, before you respond, uh, let me pursue a comment you made. No? Um, you said that uh, um, uh, vague disclosure mandates can also lead to barriers to entry or something to, to that effect no? you mentioned earlier. And I would like to ask you, uh, from your experience, um, did you see anything uh, of this uh, kind in other jurisdiction or in um, you know, government mandated full disclosure of commerciality uh, in the contracts and that, that, that turned off basically investors from coming in so just just I just want to pursue that angle and then go into the um, uh, other topics of um, downstream uh, a, a gr great question senator and thank you for the for the clarification uh, let me just say quickly on the general you know, regulatory philosophy behind disclosure. I think uh, Professor Goldberg and, and Sue have said it well. Uh, I'll make two points in the U.S. that we've learned. These are difficult lessons that we've learned. 
mandating disclosure is ineffective because broad disclosure mandates are a threat and they can be seen as as, as a as a deterrent in industry. Authorizing disclosures, I think, is what you know Sue clarified, and that's really what we're we're trying to point out here. But it does create, and I want to be very clear, obligations on the part of the government as well. For example, in the U.S., because we have a, a rather broad um, disclosure regime, the U.S. government actually carries tremendous liability if we fail to maintain confidential information, and we are sued, and we often pay our damages for failure to maintain confidential information. So there is a relationship that you are building with these disclosure entities, and they may be public or private entities at the end of the day, and that creates an obligation on the part of the government to respect that disclosure. And so what often we find in the U.S. is that if you build sufficient trust, sufficient credibility with the industry, disclosure by industry to government is one activity, and then disclosure by the government to the public is a second. And they may not be the same sets of information, but they require a trust relationship to be developed. That, that's, that's one point to be there. And one other point to make very clear, even whom is receiving the disclosures in the government is very important. In the U.S., we often don't disclose the information to the enforcement authority because they may then use that information in some sort of enforcement action, a litigation action. Enforcement tends to be to an information agency, a statistical agency, an oversight agency, an agency that is running pure analysis, is not doing enforcement. And they are prohibited by law from sharing that information with other parts of the U.S. government, for example. We call that a warehousing or a siloing or sort of you know keeping the information within one part of the government. So I want to be very clear here that... A disclosure regime, you know, that could be broad has to be respectful. The government's going to have to carry some obligations and maintain confidentiality. But also, even within the government, the standards must be put in place. And, and the lesson we've learned here, and I'll tell you the reality in the U.S., is that because we have a rather broad authority to mandate disclosure, it's very rare that we have to require it. Most disclosure in the U.S. is voluntary because industry knows that if they don't disclose... And they're not the disclosures aren't sufficient enough for the government to feel confident that they have the information they need. Then the mandatory disclosures will come, and that's burdensome on industry. So at the end of the day, the threat is enough, and oftentimes voluntary um, uh, action is enough. Now, now, Senator, I just want to make sure I, I come back to, to your to your question in terms of of if I want to say correctly, was this around the actual balance? I think you're you're saying the balance, how far one can go, or or, or what what is burdensome. I want to clarify. Uh, well, yes, uh, I would like to get uh, would like to go deeper into that balance. No, maybe give some specifics, Attorney Batrisi, on that on that balance. Like for example, what propon what for proponents, uh, what should be disclosed, uh, what type of information should be uh, enough for government to uh, make. Um, uh, decisions when it comes to competition. So, uh, specifics on that healthy balance that you mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you for clarifying. And, and this, uh, my answer here actually relates to your earlier question about uh, the approach to unbundling and how the government prepares itself to oversee a market which is shifting, which is changing uh, through unbundling. The, the approach that we found most effective in the U.S., and I'm not going to say this is universal, but it's one experience that could be helpful is that we focus disclosure less on the actors and more on the activity. What that means is we identify critical activity in the marketplace that the government is worried about. For example, a transfer of ownership, who owns a particular asset, um, a fire incident, when there's been you know, uh, uh, some sort of fire incident on, on in a particular space, uh, bankruptcy concerns, when an entity is not in bankruptcy, that's too late, when it is approaching bankruptcy, because that's, that's when the government is most concerned, because they may have to actually step in. For example, if it's a critical piece of infrastructure, the government may actually want to take over that piece of infrastructure, buy out you know, the, the, the bankrupt entity. My point there being centered is that we focus, and this is in collaboration with industry, on defining critical activities in the marketplace that are of concern to the government, mandate or at least create the authority to require disclosure around those activities. And then the actual form, the format, the depth of the disclosure, that shifts over time. But just to take a very simple one, beneficial ownership of, of an infrastructure asset is a, is a big question. Who owns a particular asset? I think there's been many concerns in the U.S., and we've had litigation over this, that requiring disclosure of every single investor in a project goes too far because some of those investors may prefer to stay confidential for a number of reasons. There may be multiple holding entities. That goes too far. The critical question may be who has majority control 
in an asset, who has sufficient ownership of an asset to be able to dictate you know, the ownership, the operations, and critical decisions. That's a threshold of disclosure. So you may not want to require all investors, all you know, equity holders, all money in the project to be disclosed, but a sufficient threshold above which if you own enough of the project, it could be the majority, it could be above 20%, you can define that internally. That's a level of disclosure. Another example, fire safety or, or safety incidents, labor incidents, you know, environmental um, you know, uh, damages. We have defined what we believe is a, a significant incident, but it's not every incident. For example, when an environmental spill goes beyond the, the boundaries of the project, when it goes you know, outside the project space, that without question, even industry would agree, is sufficient uh, enough of an incident that it has to be disclosed. But what level of, of activity, what level of incidents within the boundaries of the project? That's something that we've yes, developed in our, our industry over time, and we've agreed upon a threshold above which every incident has to be disclosed, below which you know, incidents don't have to be disclosed. And the, the flexibility there is important for two reasons. By focusing on activity, industry knows what the expectations are on disclosure, and that it's not going to be disclosed everything and then clawed back. Oh, we want to keep this part away. We want to keep this part away because these parts are commercially sensitive uh, and shouldn't be disclosed. Industry starts to build its operating procedures around disclosure, understanding which activities have to be disclosed, which essential information has to be disclosed. The other flexibility, the other reason why activity is more important than the actor is because in an unbundling environment, the actors are changing. We, we, in the US, for example, we went from unbundling 30 years ago to massive consolidation now, where we're having bigger companies come out where it used to be smaller companies before. One company may own the transmission assets, may own the production, the upstream wells, they may own the actual power plants. We're seeing an unprecedented amount of concentration and consolidation in our industry. And by focusing on activity instead of actors, you have a future-proof law that tracks the critical activity in the marketplace. But instead of saying every terminal owner has to disclose X, what if the terminal owner changes? Or instead of saying every terminal owner has to disclose a sale of gas, well, what if the terminal owner sells all of their gas to a holding company, and then that holding company sells on to a thousand different customers? You may disclose just that first sale, but those additional sales may not be captured in the law. So an, act, an activity-oriented approach is, I would say, the healthiest, the most acceptable to industry, and the most future-proof at the end of the day. And Senator, I want to make sure I've answered your question. Yes, uh, Tony, thank you. Thank you for, for, for that uh, clarification. And then uh, Senator Antiveros also has a question on the uh, downstream uh, activities. I think uh, Tony Su uh, initially answered that, and uh, you can uh, continue to elaborate on that uh, portion. Yeah, I'll just add, I think Sue covered it well, but let me just clarify two things. I think, Senator Antiveros, your point is very well taken. And if anything, it's another reason why downstream should be mentioned in the law, but perhaps not defined in the law, right? Because in anticipation that there is that there is a related you know, in, in interoperability and that there's a relationship between the two. But very simply, what we've learned in the U.S. is that by having a predictable and more importantly, information-rich midstream market, where, first of all, information is good for investors because they have you know, greater insight into the dynamics of the market. It's good for the regulator because they have you know, greater ability to, active, you know, to identify and track activity in the marketplace. But also, for something very simple, if you know how much it costs to produce, you know, import, produce, and deliver gas at the wholesale level, then you have the starting price for the rest of the downstream activity. And if you're concerned about the cost for consumers and you want to have full transparency on that value chain, you need to have a healthy midstream regulation to be able to capture and identify those costs. So the additional costs of distribution and other retail activities can be separated. And it's very clear what a consumer is actually paying for at the end of the day. And that's a big concern in the U.S. because, as I mentioned, we have sort of federal and state systems. There's not The systems don't always talk to each other. And it's hard. And I agree with your point very specifically. There has to be a close relationship between the two, and more importantly, a functional relationship. It has to be understood that a lack of transparency and predictability in the midstream will make it harder to regulate the downstream, and vice versa as well. Because a badly regulated downstream market means you may start shifting costs. You may artificially suppress your costs on the midstream side, where there's 
you know, have the oversight and inflate the costs on the distribution side, which you've seen in many uh, countries before and other actually other countries in, in Southeast Asia and in the Pacific. So I'll leave it at this is that the mechanisms by which you build in disclosure, oversight, accountability, competition, all those words in the midstream regulation can be translated to the downstream space. Mm -hmm. Our point earlier is that the metric, the concerns are different because yes, you're focused yes. much more on individual consumers and you know how they're being traded at the end of a value chain, whereas in midstream, there's multiple actors all transacting with each other, but the mechanisms are very much the same and the philosophy may be the same at the end of the day. So I think your point is very well taken. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney Badisi. It's also very interesting, uh, Mr. Chair, listening to all our resource persons, even this, these images of the of the, the the upstream, midstream, downstream, because it makes us think of the stream and how water moves and water above affects the water at, at midstream and, and downstream. So, so very helpful comments. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I, I really appreciate um, the inputs from our resource person so far. Uh, and lastly, I just like to especially um, uh, share how, how much I appreciate um, at least a couple of the the second to the last comments of uh, attorney Badisi, the point about trust, so uh, interesting, so important and very challenging, especially in the different, um, uh, well, um, uh, democracy stages our societies are in, let alone in, and plus the development stages, uh, how important the trust is and how uh, uh, legislation like our bill can in fact help build that trust even um, between and among institutions to provide that measure of stability, regardless of our political transitions, when we're talking about um, an industry development project, um, such as what is contemplated by this bill. And last but not the least, I found it so interesting uh, what Mr. Chair, what Professor Badisi said, about, I mean, Attorney Badisi said about uh, sometimes a, broad, a broader mandate uh, gives birth to more voluntary disclosure. <laughs> Very interesting, and so thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, to to all our resource persons so far for the for the very helpful uh, inputs. Salamat, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, thank you, uh, Senator Antiveros. I have um I have a question on TPA, which is a core uh, concept on this law of this law, and uh, I would like to and forgive me for shuffling between uh, Professor Suke and uh, Attorney Badisi and Attorney Logan um, on the topic of TPA. Uh, I read the uh, the uh, compilation of Professor Silke on the, the European energy markets, and uh, from what I gathered and my understanding on that compilation, um, in Europe, uh, TPA is a rule. You know? um, all the terminals, all the pipelines uh, are subjected to TPA, and there are exemptions. And the exemptions can be in the form of incentives or in the form of uh, energy security and others. No, uh, in the U.S., I understand it's different. No, and in the, in the U.S., it's a licensing procedure. Uh, we tried to put those two concepts in the bill, but uh, I just want to uh, understand from our resource persons uh, if which model is best suited for the Philippines, uh, considering that we are a nascent industry, considering that uh, we'll be um, uh, importing gas uh, in the next few years, uh, is a absolute rule on TPA a good model here in the Philippines uh, versus, let's say, a licensing model from the onset? And I want to start with uh, Professor Silke and then later on move to uh, Attorney Logan and Attorney Badisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me answer this by going back in history a little bit. So I mentioned earlier that a lot of the European level legislation came in over a period of uh, three separate uh, liberalization packages. When TPA was introduced in the European Union, it was introduced in a market that had already largely developed its gas sector um, and which has also crucially in, uh, already established the necessary energy infrastructure. So um, gas, gas pipelines in particular, LNG is sort of historically a little bit later um, than gas pipelines uh, in all of this. But the energy infrastructure was established and the, the sector as such was established. 
Um, it seems to be, therefore, if I extrapolate on the basis of the European experience, then saying giving industry a chance to develop and to create the necessary infrastructure and uh, to uh, on the basis of a, cl a clear and stable regulatory regime seems to be a helpful approach. Um, and uh, I don't know whether that means that you need to license or to um, um, do it in a, in a different way. So it is not so much the form that matters, I don't think, but what is important is that um, the form in which it happens leaves enough space for industry to create the necessary infrastructure. I've made, made a couple of comments in relation to the legislative franchise issues, and that seems to be a very complex process looking at it from, from the outside and uh, has a number of uh, potential issues attached to it. Um, I think my main concern is that um, you can only give really third party, conceptually, I can only see a sort of a third party access working well where the investors investors and the, the sector is secure in, in its development. If it's set out from the outset, I can't think of an historical model, at least within Europe, where that was as such from, from the outset. Dennis, Mr. Chairman, whether that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Silke. Um, Attorney Badisi, Attorney Logan, any, any comments? Uh, I'll start with a, with a quick uh, observation, then I'll invite you to... I'll, I'll let you know, Senator, that this was something we spent weeks discussing internally. Um, and I think Professor Goldberg has a, a, an excellent point, and she's absolutely correct. There is not a lot of precedent in this space. Um, I would love to tell you that we have, you know, uh, good lessons to draw from. The reality in Europe, um, I think uh, I can't say it better than Professor Goldberg, it, it stems from their experience. In the U.S., we actually outlawed third-party access. It was determined to be, you know, um, a, an overburdensome restriction on commercial authority. Uh, mind you, we have lots of other natural gas infrastructure, so it wasn't a real security concern. Um, and, but... In Japan, you see third party access was a big concern for a while, but it's been, you know, used very minimally. I think, for, you know, Sue mentioned the fact that in, in Thailand and Malaysia, third party access initially was a quite weak regime. It was underutilized. It was reformed over time, made stronger, more, you know, uh, more mandatory, more mandatory offerings of excess capacity to the marketplace. And now you're starting to see a greater utilization of third party access. I think it, it gives you two lessons that are important for the purposes of drafting this law. I would not be burdened by the lessons of other markets uh, because I think other markets, especially other gas markets are hyper local. They are unique to their characteristics. And I, I will point out again that the concern in the Philippines, leaving aside market dynamics and costs and consumers and, and, and you know, um, all those efficiency questions, just pure energy security, keeping the lights on. The fact that you're talking about replacing one gas reservoir, which has been so fundamentally important to your energy security, with another source of gas raises so many concerns in the marketplace about making sure that that new gas source is predictable, that to not require third-party access, to let a terminal sit there underutilized is a security concern. It's an energy security concern for the country. That's an argument that I would make. But I don't know what that means in terms of the law and i want to be very honest with you senator that that there i don't think any of the countries faced the challenge that you have and i i think probably if i were to offer an observation and is that you will have to develop a third-party access regime over time that addresses these market concerns these security concerns but is acceptable to industry and i think it comes back to the philosophy we talked about with disclosure that you know mandating in the law that third-party access is required for every terminal but allowing at an early stage in the market development that terminals may apply for a variance an exception that for the first five ten however many years i think that number could be discussed with industry that third-party access requirements will be lifted or perhaps limited you know 80 percent of capacity can be reserved 70 percent those numbers aren't a concern at the law at this point but they would be a concern for implementing regulation that's likely the healthiest approach to this question because we do not have a good answer. Um, and so I, I think at a framework level, 
I, I think the Philippines is unique in the sense that third-party access is critically important for both market and security reasons. I think it has to be clearly stated and, and mandated in the law at the outset, as opposed to other markets which have put it in over time. But the mechanics of third-party access, the way it is managed and implemented, I think will have to be developed over time. But but Sue, as I said, we've talked about this internally for, for weeks. I, I don't know if you if you have other, if you want to share the other parts of the debate that we've had. Um. I think I think that Attorney Badisi is his approach is um, is a good one. I would, with respect to having TPA as sort of the the default versus own use being um, the likely default if given the sort of choice to to choose one of the other paths. Another, um, if that's not for whatever reason, whether it's politically, whether it's um, what you hear from private industry, whether it's just, um, you know, whatever reason you, you have, if you maintain this sort of current system where um, open access, um, or sorry, own use, own use permitting is sort of up to the investor. And you may, that, you know, that sounds very attractive to, to the investor, investor market. And so there may be um, a strategic reason to have that in the law, and another way, and if that's what you choose to do um, for for a number of reasons, um, what you what we didn't see in the in the law, and maybe it maybe it's because it was not quite clear. Maybe it's because the duration of the permits isn't um, clearly set out in the law. But it you know there there was it seemed as though there are these two parallel tracks of. You're either own use or TPA, and you can have maybe maybe it's 50-50 of your capacity for a given terminal. But I didn't see a way to um, change that at any time, unless the permits are sort of on an um, annual basis or periodic basis where, where one could say, um, okay, well, I've developed this terminal with my affiliated sort of downstream like power plant. They want, we want to divest from this um, from this power plant from our portfolio, it wasn't clear to me what would happen in that scenario, whether you could switch your permit from, from own use to then, I guess it would, I don't know if it would be own use or TPA at that point, but it didn't seem that, that you could switch. Another thing that I didn't see sort of clearly set out in the law um, as even being an, having an ability to do um, maybe later on down the line is if there is an if there is a facility that's built for own use, and perhaps it was um, sort of a a gamble on the part of a developer the terminal and its downstream use cases, um, perhaps they were to be in phases, and those phases don't pan out, um, and they have they're sitting on capacity that could otherwise be used to to transport to import um, whatever. Um, you might say, well, it would be economically rational for them to open that capacity up, um, but there may be more strategic reasons why they wouldn't. Um, and I think there's no, in the U.S., as in a similar context for transmit power transmission lines, we have there's a there's a concept where if there's a sort of a trunk transmission line and you're a developer, you build let's say you build a power plant and you have to build a um, generation tie line. So you build a, a transmission line to connect, a connector line to the, to the main grid. Um, and you build that line over capacity because you anticipate that you're gonna use that to build several, several plants. And you end up, for, what you, for whatever reason you don't. There, the law specifies that there's a certain period of time that you have to use the capacity that you've sort of built for. And if you don't, at that point, you could be, if, if someone, that other developers, other users can request access for that. And in that case, you must give it. Um, so that's just another way to kind of approach this on a sort of, um, I guess, uh, incremental way. Um, because I think the name of the game for the Philippines, because of the way that you're, the, the, stage of the market that you're operating under here is that having flexibility, like, of course, investors need a clear regulatory regime. Um, you can't just change the rules on them in the, mid in the middle. Um, but 
being able to change the rules for future you know, in future cases or in certain cases, such as if you don't you if there is excess capacity that you are not using within the sort of specified time frame, um, that that can be opened up. So it's it's sort of for each kind of scenario you run through as to you know what if we only use own use? What if we only have um, third party access? I think the way to think about it is um, sort of worse thinking about the worst case scenario of every option um, and sort of going with what you feel is the least, the least worst case, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney uh, Badisi, Attorney Logan. Uh, just to pursue that question no, uh, on TPA, uh, again, forgive me for, for shuffling between uh, Professor Silke and um, the CLDP team. Um, Professor Silke, from your observation, what would be a efficient process for TPA? Uh, just give us a, a walkthrough, a simple walkthrough uh, uh, for a simple process of a TPA uh, from your observation in Europe and other jurisdictions. Uh, and can you also give us um, what would be a, not only efficient, but what would be a successful process for a TPA or an execution of a TPA. Can give thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I can give you some examples of how TPA is organised in Europe. And again, I would like to underline the the comments made by Attorney Logan and by Attorney Bedisi. Um, it is not necessarily transferable on a one-to-one -one basis. So, because the markets are at very different stages. In Europe, the uh, TPA is uh, by and large enshrined in law. It was in successively introduced over three liberalization uh, packages. Um, it is by and large regulated TPA. Um, it's also important to note that initially it was negotiated TPA, so NTPA for the vast majority of energy infrastructure as an introductory sort of step towards um, RTPA. Um, you, uh, Senator, uh, you mentioned earlier the various European incentives and exemption regimes. <clears throat> Where a facility has such an exemption or a, a, a relevant incentive, the regulatory practice is often that 80% um, of such a facility is reserved for own use or for sh anchor, share anchor shareholders, um, and then 20% are put up for regulated access. This is um, true across pipelines, interconnectors, and, um, and terminals in, in a variety of ways, but broadly that these are the sort of the hallmarks of, um, of the relations there. Uh, a TPA regime is successful if it's well understood by all market participants. It is successful if it is clear and transparent, and if it has mitigating um, mitigating features, because third party access can also be used in an adverse way um, for uh, the either the owner of the relevant infrastructure or other participants. So. Um, it could be used as a as, as an aggressive commercial tool against uh, an owner of a terminal, so that somebody comes and demands TPA, then hoards the capacity and doesn't actually use it, so effectively sterilizes capacity for the market. And that is a concern from both the investor's perspective, because they can't access their capacity. And secondly, that must also be a concern from a wider industry perspective, because it links to supply security. Um, where so the mechanisms to go against that, to mitigate those sort of scenarios have been introduced, they've typically relied on use it or lose it um, sort of mechanism. Use it or lose it mechanisms means that, that if somebody who has booked capacity, regulated capacity, this is not own use capacity, this is separate. Um, and if that entity then doesn't proceed to use that capacity, they have to notify that on uh, a digital board to the wider market 
within various prescriptive timelines. Um, I have previously designed a TPA regime for an exempted uh, LN, European exempted LNG terminal um, in in England, the Dragon Terminal, um, which um, took into account the timelines it takes for an LNG tanker to arrive um, or the turnaround points of LNG tankers under contractual notification periods, how much time is necessary for an LNG tanker to arrive from various points around the world, um, how much notification did LNG operator need. So it's a fairly technical level of operation as well. And the key here is um, for that to work successfully um, is again, actually a point that attorneys uh, Logan and Padisi made earlier, it's about industry standards, working very closely with industry. Most of the, if not actually all, of the gas, the downstream and midstream section of the British gas se uh, sector work on the basis of industry agreements rather than law. So. The Uniform Network Code is an industry agreement. The Balancing and Settlement Code for the electricity sector is an industry agreement. It's not a law. Third party access is, um, whilst enshrined in law, the actual application of it has been developed in consultation with industry. Um, the regulator of GEM in Britain has actually looked to industry for models of how can use it or lose it be developed. So much so that when Ofgem was asked to define use it or lose it, they said it's something we can't define, we know it works when we see it. And because they wanted to leave it open to, to develop workable models with industry and sort of that is, um, so if I might summarise, um, a successful TPA regime is something that's accepted by industry, something that is understood by all market participants, clear, transparent, and uh, worked on in consultation with industry. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Attorney Logan, Attorney Badisi, any comments on the process uh, for a successful TPA? I did, I did thought that Professor Goldberg summed up sort of the parameters quite well. Um, so I will not, in the interest of time, I won't um, uh, add to that. Um, I thought that was great, but uh, Attorney Badisi, please, please go ahead. I, I can't add much other than just to say one more point. This ties back to our discussion on, on disclosure. One of the questions around third party access is that the government is really only concerned where the access is not being granted. Let me be very clear. To the extent that third party access is permitted, that a terminal owner is open to the, the transaction, that a, that a third party wants to license that capacity, there's very little you know, activity for the government to do. There's very little oversight that's necessary. That's a, a, a straightforward, you know, consensual, you know, willing buyer, willing seller type of transaction. It, it's really where there's a possibility that access is being you know, retained inappropriately in the marketplace. That the government is concerned and so to answer your, your question senator you know what is a functional regime a functional regime is one that permits as much voluntary activity as possible with as few barriers as possible where those willing transactions are, are generally permitted maybe there's some disclosure um, to make sure that they're not sort of shadow transactions to tie up you know capacity inappropriately but that the government through that disclosure regime if it becomes aware of underutilized capacity and uh, the inability of a third party to access it that's where the really difficult questions are asked. And I think Sue mentioned one very important solution, which is when a third party requests access and, and, and believes that that access has been inappropriately denied you know, on a non-commercial basis, an appeal can be made to the government. I think Professor Goldberg makes an excellent point. How that appeal is handled uh, is important because if it's an automatic you know, sort of uh, grant of access that can be used disruptively, so the ability of third parties to raise concerns is essential in the marketplace. That is absolutely essential. So the, the role of third parties is key, but also the policing authority of the government, the government's ability, for example, to request, you know, what is your expected utilization over the next 12, 18, 36 months? Uh, one example that we've seen in other markets is that by requiring, uh, you know, terminals or other important actors, again, the activity is the important thing, by requiring disclosure of supply agreements, not the entire agreement, but the, you know, the key elements, 
the government can then extrapolate, well, if you signed up to import X amount of gas over the next you know, year, five years, 10, then we know this amount of capacity is being used. And you can reach the logical conclusion that you, know, you should take the amount of committed gas purchase as an indication of utilization of capacity. You can maybe allow a reserve on top of that, 20% for some flexibility where a terminal may want to, you know, or some buyer may want to buy on the spot market. But if those gas supply agreements only add up to 50% of the capacity, and you're still allowing that 20% you know, reserve, then clearly at that moment, the government has a credible reason you know, through a process that's open, transparent, uh, and predictable to mandate access to the remaining capacity amount. And maybe that's done on an annual basis, biannual. Maybe early on, you allowed for three years, and maybe you shorten the time period as the market matures. So uh, to, to summarize, Senator, I, I think the way in which the government will police the marketplace, the way in which it will identify underutilization of capacity is more important than the actual mechanism of licensing the third party itself, because hopefully at that point, if the, the access has been mandated, the parties will openly negotiate terms that are acceptable to them. Then, Attorney DC, we go back to the issue of disclosure, because the only way uh, government can effectively police um, the actors is if they have information and disclosure. And uh, finding that right balance, as what Senator uh, Hontiveros mentioned earlier in the law, is actually the most critical part. You know? Because the only way government can effectively police the actors is they have information, if they have um, uh, data uh, that can lead to their uh, conclusions of undercapacity or withholding capacity. You know? So we go back to that original premise earlier, as mentioned. Um, with that, uh, Senator Antiveros, I've, I've actually um, asked most of my questions. Uh, Senator Antiveros, any more questions or resource persons? Um, not to our international resource persons, Mr. Chairman, but to our Philippine resource persons. Yes, a few more. Salamat. Oh, yeah, but la lastly, before I uh, let um, uh, Professor Silke, Attorney Badisi, and Attorney um, Logan, go because I know it's already super late in the hour in your jurisdictions, in your host countries. It's just a very basic question, Professor Siki. What would be a, what concept should be included in the uh, midstream bill that we are talking about? I know we have already a, 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 a draft bill right now, but uh, what do you think would be very crucial concepts? that should be placed in the bill so that we will achieve a vibrant, a successful midstream natural gas sector here in the Philippines. Of course, taking into consideration and taking into account uh, consumer welfare, delivering the best price, and of course, competition. So just brought, just the concepts. We want to make sure that we have captured uh, all the important concepts uh, that you have um, experienced uh, in your own jurisdiction. So again, uh, we'll start with the professors Silke and then the CLDP team. Salamat, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would perhaps say, come back to something I said at the very beginning, looking at all of the various jurisdictions I've looked at and I've worked on, I've sort of European, I've, in European jurisdictions, I've also advised on the privatization of uh, the uh, power industry in Nigeria and uh, in, in Oman. So very different, all very different jurisdictions. But the one common theme that kept on coming out was um, predictability of the regulatory regime and stability of the regulatory regime with this, uh, Attorney Badisi uh, mentioned it earlier, enough future proofing in there. So again, an example from the European liberalization process, the European liberalization process was very fixated on institutions. It was very much an institutionalized liberalization and they had to play catch up as the market changed quite a lot. Um, so as new actors came or new market participants came onto the market, technology might have changed. Um, so the most important thing is the transparency and stability of the regulatory regime, um, which doesn't have too many, um, 
that which allow us the basically which allow us the investors to develop the infrastructure. So effectively, you're in a great position in the Philippines because you can think fresh on what would you like to have as your gas regulatory framework. In Europe, it happened the other way around. The gas infrastructure was there and then people, start, legislators started to think about hmm, what should we do at a European level with all this infrastructure and how should we regulate it. Here, you're in a unique position because you can you get to encourage the building of that infrastructure and the building up of that sector through what you're doing in the legislative process at the moment. And therefore, um, stability of that regime is um, transparency is is really very, very key. Professor, what do you think we should still include conceptually in the bill? Or have we captured uh, the, the, more, the, 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 the critical points uh, conceptually in the bill? But do, do you have any more concepts that you think we should um, put in, in, into this uh, proposed draft law? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I actually believe that you have all the big categories of concepts that I would ordinarily, if I sort of open a gas bill or um, an energy sector bill, um, your bill has conceptually all the concepts that are uh, that are typically found in such bills. So I, there is not an immediate lacuna that springs to mind, if I might put it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Attorney Badisi, Attorney Logan, any uh, same questions? Sure. Um, I agree with Professor Goldberg um, on both accounts. Um, with respect to um, kind of concepts in the law, um, and I think this goes in just what I'm thinking of it um, now, sort of contemporary, contemporaneously, um, third party access does come to mind. I think one thing to um, bear in mind when, as I said, going through sort of the worst case scenario, if we structure third party access in this way, or in this way, or in this way, um, one thing to bear in mind um, when you're thinking of structuring is, of course, um, private sector actors want to make sure that their um, that their rather large investments will be protected and that thing the rug won't be swept out from under them from a regulatory perspective. But I think um, as I think it's important to bear in mind that this is sort of a developing market, um, a, a nascent market that will be developed over time that will change over time. And I think it's important to just bear in mind and to think about just to have it as sort of a um a little um idea bubble in your head um when when looking at the law is to avoid creating um too much entrenched interest in ha in one particular structure and that's not and as an example for that um if you know we mentioned that uh attorney badisi mentioned that perhaps the best the a better way or perhaps a good way to structure the tpa access regime is to have um, mandatory third-party access with uh, with the ability to request exceptions for um, the ability to get an investment going or um, or other reasons. Um, perhaps that's um, perhaps that's a better way to do it. Perhaps not for your market. Um, but whatever you choose, especially if you choose sort of um, own use as a right um, from the from the beginning, I think it's important for. Um, for investors to know that um, that own use may not may need to change or may not be a right forever, if that makes sense. So, you know, as long as they understand that, of course, the investments will be protected, but if you have un unused capacity, you cannot sit on that forever. That is not within the, the boundaries of what own use means f to us. Um, I think having that sort of just in avoiding creating uh, sort of entrenched interests that will be difficult uh, to change the law later or that will object to changes to the law or the regulations later, um, it will be sort of important. Mr. Chairman, um, with your permission, yes, may, uh, may I add one, uh, one thought that is just listening to Attorney Logan 
and thinking about how the bill has been drafted in relation to the uh, attorney Logan, you mentioned own use and, and sort of concepts around that, the, um, which has led me to think about incentives for, um, uh, we talked a lot about how the infrastructure will need to be created in the Philippines and own use in Europe is one of the major incentives, incentives factors. And um, I'm not sure that the bill current, current <coughs> currently spells out the stimuli or the incentives around our own use and perhaps also other types of incentives in order to create that infrastructure um, which my understanding of the Philippine industry is such that the, the the whole infrastructure would need to be created pretty much from the beginning um, and um, typically what we've seen there in other jurisdictions is an emphasis in comparative comparable bills on on incentives um, and some of which, uh, Senator Gachali and Mr. Chairman, we have already discussed in relation to, um, by, by, by way of reference to the European um, incentives that are available. Uh, apologies, um, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Thank you, Professor. Attorney Bedisi, any comments on uh, concepts uh, in the bill? Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I think, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, having seen the progression of the bill, I think it, it's, it is nearly complete. Uh, no significant, um, you know, missing components. I, I would point out one thing that I think, as, I, as we said at the very outset, that the primary function of a midstream law is to draw boundaries. One boundary that could be perhaps a bit more clear uh, is what is not a terminal. Um, and for example, in the U.S., where I'm calling you from right now, I'm in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, a gas station which is down the road from me has an LNG filling station. It is a, is a gas station with an LNG pump. Well, it's not a pump. It's a much more advanced thing. But you can, you can buy LNG at a gas station down the road from my house. Is that an LNG terminal? Is it regulated as a midstream asset or is it a downstream asset that is selling to retail consumers? Does it function differently? That's an easier question perhaps to define under the law. And I think the law is, is mostly clear but not entirely clear on that point. Where it gets more complicated is if you have a regular terminal, as we have in Europe and some other places, where that, that terminal typically receives large ships and then injects the, the regasified gas into the in the transmission system. But now we have trucks coming and off-taking LNG in truck capacity. We have smaller ships, you know, taking off-taking LNG and then sort of redistributing it. We're putting it into containers. You should imagine a future where a terminal has more than one form of off-take in more than one form of activity taking place, which means that terminal operator may be simultaneously selling wholesale gas into the wholesale pipeline system, but selling gas to an individual consumer. It could be a ship, it could be a, another type of, of, of buyer. I think that doesn't require significant changes to the law. Most importantly, you wanna make sure that you're not disrupting or prohibiting that evolution under the law, that you allow for that evolution to, to take place. I, I think that is mostly there. Perhaps it could be made more clear that the law is not meant to prohibit or somehow disrupt uh, those other activities. But beyond that, I, I, I genuinely agree, I think, with my other colleagues that uh, it is very much complete or near complete in its current form. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Badisi, Attorney Logan, Professor Silke. I know it's already uh... 3 a.m. in the UK and 10 p.m. there in uh, DC. Uh, but I really appreciate your participation and your openness in uh, assisting us with this uh, draft law. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, our aim is to develop our midstream and hopefully our downstream natural gas industry in the future uh, with an end in view of um, uh, protecting our consumers, giving the best price and the best service to our consumers, and to also to promote uh, healthy competition among our players. So with that, thank you very much for your time, and uh, feel free to send us more comments as we uh, go along this bill, and definitely we will uh, reach out to you and ask for your uh, opinion on certain aspects as we go along. So thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you, you very much, Mr. Chairman. Salamat. Salamat. Thank you. So uh, with that, uh, we will now go to our next resource person, which is the uh, Department of Energy. And uh, we're joined by uh, Director Rino Abad uh, to, the ASIC, oh, sorry, to uh, Assistant Secretary uh, uh, Bodhi Polido for their comments on the bill. Oh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Senator Risa Hontiveros. 
Mr. Chair, we'd like to uh, be given the opportunity to share a quick general comment uh, regarding the really productive discussion that you had, uh, you and uh, Senator Hunter has had with Professor Goldberg and Attorney Slogan and Badisi. Uh, and, and then afterwards, we'd like to make a, a manifestation regarding an administrative matter uh, regarding the Department of Energy. Uh, and so listening to the discussion amongst you, uh, I, I believe we can distill, distill that discussion into essentially three major conceptual takeaways, and that's uh, trust, uh, evolution, and of course the unique context of the Philippines, uh, well, the, the energy situation in the Philippines, and why this bill is so, is so critical uh, for the efforts of the Department of Energy uh, in terms of uh, energy security. Um, and I'm going to say something that I think the, uh, a lot of our stakeholders would, would uh, make them cringe, uh, and that um, after uh, listening to those three uh, conceptual takeaways, um, I believe the legislative and the industry and our stakeholders will have to trust the executive department. Uh, I believe that the enabling law, this, this draft bill, uh, has to have provisions that are flexible enough that would allow the DOE and the ERC uh, I, I believe the ability and the opportunity uh, to, to evolve the implementing rules and the regulations uh, as we slowly and progressively mature uh, the LNG industry. Um, there's going to be a lot of challenges in doing that, uh, specifically because of the fact that it's so new and it's so nascent. Uh, and it's going to be going through uh, several developmental stages. Uh, and each of these developmental stages we're, we're, are going to have uh, its own specific challenges uh, and issues. Uh, and we have to do all of those things in relation to how it impacts our power sector, how it impacts, of course, our own upstream energy resource development efforts. Uh, we do have uh, an ongoing effort with the PCECP. Uh, we believe we still have a lot of uh, indigenous resources in the West Philippine Sea and in the rest of the country. Uh, and then again, um, and it's part of the challenge, really, uh, although we do agree with uh, some of the comments made by our resource persons, uh, one of the mandates of the Department of Energy is to ensure that the consumers are protected uh, and that there will be fair competition and transparency. Uh, and so given all that, uh, we were very supportive of the bill as it is. Uh, we do have some specific comments and that's when I move on to our manifestation regarding an initiative matter that occurred. Uh, and again, trust is critical and trust is important and again, Trust begins with accountability, uh, and we'd like to take this opportunity, Mr. Chair, if we could apologize uh, because our team sent the wrong document uh, to your team. And we'd like to beg the kind indulgence of the Committee on Energy uh, and to our stakeholders if we could be given time to file a revised uh, comment on, on the bill. Uh, so we would like to ask, uh, uh, we'd like to ask apology from, from uh, uh, we, well, uh, we'd like to apologize for that. Uh, that was uh, an initial mishap on our part. Uh, and specifically, uh, Mr. Chair, before uh, I finish, we'd like to uh, manifest that um, we would really be uh, appreciative if the bill could contain that specific provision that was uh, earlier discussed by Attorney Badisi, uh, which would we, we believe would be very useful in that it allows uh, the DOE and the national government to... to to evolve fast in, in uh, managing uh, this nascent industry. And that's uh, the, uh, the incorporation by doctrine clause, which would allow the national government, in, in essence, to um, adopt the standards that can be developed by the industry. Uh, that would be a very, very useful. It's a very useful, we, we can already imagine how, how useful that tool would be uh, and something that we could uh, uh, really use uh, in helping develop policy and in regulating the industry. Uh, so again, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity uh, to manifest our general comment. Uh, regarding your specific comments, again, we apologize for uh, the, the document that we sent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, ASEC. And uh, ASEC, you know very well that this is not the first time that we've talked, this, talked about this bill. Uh, we've been developing this bill for the last uh, two years already, you know, shuffling papers back and forth. In fact, we've met with uh, Attorney Bedisi on several occasions, physically and also online. Uh, Attorney Bedisi was here a few times to talk about this bill. And uh, we were just surprised that uh, we were 
uh, furnished with a uh, an official document. Uh, personally, I thought that was the official document, the official position paper of the Department of Energy. And uh, I was quite surprised because even after talking about this for the last two years, um, and there was some confusion on uh, what the DOE, what the DOE's position is. And um, uh, I was hoping that we will get more detailed discussion today on the bill, you know, because uh, the bill on hand right now is um, uh, quite important to, uh, in terms of moving forward with this industry. And I would really like to discuss with the department on the several concepts uh, in the bill. You know? And um, the department being the implementer of this bill, your voice and opinion is very important because we don't want a bill that the department cannot execute. And we don't want a bill that the department has a lot of uh, misgivings. So that's why I was quite surprised that uh, we were furnished with an unofficial document and now I understand that uh, there is no position yet no, on the bill, or there is a general position, but there's no detailed uh, position on the concepts of the bill. Um, your apology is well taken, but uh, I would like to get a definite uh, answer and definite comment on the different concepts in the bill. Uh, we need to move forward together, uh, legislative and executive, especially in this legislative process, because again, at the end, it will be the department who will be executing this uh, bill. So we don't want uh, finger pointing to happen uh, after going through a very taxing legislative process. And you know that, no, the, the legislative process is not simple. No, it's, it's very complicated and very taxing. So with that, I don't know, uh, Asik, if you want to discuss the different concepts in the bill or reserve your comment uh, later on, uh, this will be the first hearing. We will have another hearing um, next week. But uh, I would like to ask you if you are ready to answer uh, on the different concepts that we included in the bill uh, because um, we will definitely take into account your comments and uh, adjust uh, certain provisions if you deem necessary to adjust. No? So are you ready to discuss those concepts right now? Uh, Mr. Chair, if we could be, if we could uh, ask for the indulgence of uh, the chair, uh, if we could be given until um, Monday next week, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the challenge uh, really was the, how to put it all together with the other bureaus and the other services uh, within the Department of Energy. Uh, there's still a bit of um, uh, a bit of healthy internal discussion uh, insofar as the specific provisions are concerned. Uh, so if we could be given, uh, Mr. Chair, until Monday next week to submit our formal uh, comments to the bill, uh, or our specific comments to the bill. Uh, and again, Mr. Chair, we, we, we really apologize for uh, the uh, transmission of the uh, wrong of a wrong document that was sent to your office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With, with that, uh, again, ASEC, take note that we've been discussing and developing this bill for the last two years. So uh, I would expect that the department will have a definite uh, uh, position on on the matter. And uh, like uh, this is this is a work in progress, no. Uh, I acknowledge that this bill will evolve throughout the legislative process, and that's 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 the nature of this work. But um, uh, the voice of the Department of Energy and the ERC is so important that uh, we will give it a lot of weight uh, when it comes to the concepts that that we will be discussing on hand. So, yeah, we will um, await your await for your official position. Um, hopefully. Uh, it will be as detailed as possible. Our, our next hearing will be next Tuesday, and uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you can furnish uh, us your uh, uh, detailed um, position paper on Friday. So we have uh, ample time to digest it and to analyze it, and by Tuesday we'll have enough time to discuss it. So um, with that, uh, we'll move on to another important uh, institution in this bill, which is the Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, represented by um, 
Sirio. By uh, Miss Leila Sirio. Uh, good morning, Chair. Um, actually, the commission, through the leadership of our chairperson, Agnes de Benadera, it, uh, supports the national policy and framework for the development of the and regulation of the Philippine downstream industry, uh, especially that um, it will ensure that it will ensure energy security through the promotion of nat gas as so an additional energy environment friendly energy source, as well as it will um, provide uh, protection to the consumers by mandating competitive rates, fees, and charges. Um, actually, we have some a few comments on, on, on the bill, and uh, I hope you will also still allow us to submit uh, addition um, our comments. Um, but we observe that the powers and responsibilities provided in this bill are, are clear. There is a well delineation of duties between ERC and POE. Um, and there are some points that we just want to be clarified about. So uh, if you will allow us to submit our comments um, uh, within the week or next or on Monday, so that we will be able to look uh, uh, further into this uh, uh, provision, especially on the powers and responsibilities of the Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, thank you, Ms. Laila. Thank you very much for your comments. But uh, I hope that you've taken note that uh, the responsibilities of the ERC here is quite important, no? considering that uh, some of the uh, sectors such as the transmission, the distribution, will be, a highly, regu will be highly regulated. And uh, we know for a fact that uh, ERC will be new in this uh, uh, activity, and uh, that's why we want to talk to ERC uh, on a very detailed manner on the powers that will be lodged under ERC and also the concepts that were uh, embedded in the law. Um, are you ready to discuss that or you want to defer that to again next uh, Tuesday? Uh, I think we have to defer uh, defer uh, for next Tuesday, sir. So again, uh, Ms. Leila, but uh, next Tuesday will be the last hearing, hopefully. So uh, we would like to hear your detailed comments, especially on the powers being delegated to ERC, on the industries uh, that will be regulated by in the ERC, and the capacity building needed uh, by the ERC. Also the budget, of course. Um, again, no, you're regulating electric power right now. But uh, in the future, you'll be regulating natural gas, uh, specifically transmission and distribution. And we want to know exactly what are the requirements needed by um, ERC in so far as building capacity, in so far as developing its uh, talent, and most of all, budget. So, and also, if the powers delineated between uh, DOE and ERC are clear no? because we, we know for a fact that there are uh, in the electric power industry there are sometimes uh, confusion on who will be the uh, uh, institution um, promulgating circulars or promulgating rules for a specific uh, uh, topic. So we want to make sure that the lines are well delineated so that um, uh, the actors and the players will be clear on who to talk to. Okay, sorry. Yes. Uh, Senator Risa, any comments to um, DOE and to ERC? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I actually had um, a few questions for each of these important, you know, as the chairman said, very important agencies. So I'm a bit puzzled, Mr. Chairman, because as the chairman has said, um, the bill has been in development for a couple of years. And in fact, 
this hearing has been uh, rescheduled twice, and certainly our DOE and ERC resource persons are fully aware of that. So I'm just a bit puzzled about this turn of events, Mr. Chair. But I will um, I will submit to the guidance of the chair. Should I post my question to ERC now, or should I also just postpone it till till Tuesday, Mr. Chairman? I would suggest, uh, Santa Teresa, with your uh, indulgence, to defer it until next Tuesday so that uh, our uh, two agencies um, will be more prepared. Uh, I'm equally puzzled as you. Uh, yes. In fact, this is not uh, a new bill. It took us two years no? um, because it's, it's, it's a new industry. Uh, frankly speaking, I had to learn a lot also. So it took us two years to build this law. Uh, mm -hmm. looking at other jurisdictions, talking to experts, talking to our private proponents. And you're right, no? this was deferred uh, for almost a month. And mm -hmm. uh, quite sadly, uh, the two main actors in this bill are not ready to discuss in de greater detail the concepts right. of the bill. No? I'm really so, hoping, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, that, that the, the uh, private sector resource persons that the chair has invited on behalf of the committee, I'm expecting that they will be prepared. Bakang mangyari dito sa 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 development ng industry na ito, Mr. Chair. Tulad nung sinalay sa ng ating mga international resource persons that the private sector will go ahead, and then government will have to adjust in terms of as as they said, no, in conversation with um, with industry. Uh, uh, crafting or 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 uh, refining and then fully implementing the legislation uh, although mr chair i do have one slightly um well, not not specifically related to the bill question for erc on the veco bill shock may i ask just that question of them in this hearing mr chairman yes go ahead since uh, erc you, is ready here Apo. salamat um ms leila uh, could i just ask ma'am uh, a complaint before the ERC was filed against the Visayan Electric Company for allegedly overpricing its customers. Uh, apparently, our Cebuano sisters and brothers experienced the same bill shock, on uh, the term coined by the chairman, experienced the same bill shock as power consumers in Metro Manila. So just for my single question for the uh, commission this morning, uh, what is the status of this case? And also, could we be furnished, uh, the, could the committee be furnished through the chair, a copy of the complaint and other documents for our reference, Mr. Chairman? Ms. Leila, you may uh, respond. Uh, good morning, Senator Risa. Good morning, um, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Paul. Um, actually, I am not so aware of uh, that issue. So I think we can uh, provide you information after this um, meeting. Please do. Thank you, ma'am. Salamat po, yeah. Mr. Chair. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next resource person or resource um, institution is the, the Philippine Competition Commission. Again, uh, the PCC uh, has a special uh, responsibility in this bill. And... Um, um, the earlier on the, the conversation around the tpa is a conversation on efficiency and competition no and if you look at the bill the tpa occupies a very big uh, space and discussion in the bill because we want to assure that uh, from the onset uh, there will be a vibrant and healthy competition among industry players but in the absence of players uh, we have to make sure that competition is still vibrant no and uh, it will redound to the benefit of our consumers. So let uh, let me call on the PCC, represented by Attorney Faye uh, Desagon. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, Senator Tiveros. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, thank you again for inviting the PCC. Let me just uh, open with the first game into awareness of the drafting of this measure earlier last year, uh, sometime I think in uh, mid-June, uh, uh, one of our commissioners actually pointed out that uh, Senator uh, Ketchalian is working on 
on this measure, and we have been discussing it. Understandably, uh, it is a new industry that we're looking into. Um, so it is uh, taking us a little bit more time understanding the kind of market that we should expect from this industry. Uh, so that said, we do have three main points uh, that we will expound on further through a, posi a formal position paper that we hope to be able to submit within the week. Um, so three points, two of which will discuss uh, conceptual, the conceptual uh, 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 things that we discussed earlier with the uh, foreign uh, experts and one on a jurisdictional matter. So first of all, Mr. Chair, is um, uh, earlier it was uh, emphasized that really the policy is uh, focused on making sure that we deliver the supply to the consumers and and, and there was a lot of things said about uh, fostering investment and um, taking care not to encourage having preferential contracts. So one of the things that we, uh, uh, we noted, uh, uh, particularly said by Professor Sil uh, Goldberg, was that uh, the TPA should, uh, the, the kind of mechanism that TPA is um, establishing is supposed to promote competition. Um, based on how the bill is crafted so far, at least from our point of view. Um, it may be counteracted. That whole concept of the TPA being prom uh, promoting competition might actually be counteracted by how we treat um, or uh, by the proposed uh, mechanism or classification of um, of uh, TPAs uh, or of the transmission systems as um, a public utility. Uh, Mr. Chair, if, if I'd be allowed to remind the committee, uh, the, the PCC has, um, has made its proposals, on, particularly through the Public Services Act amendments bill, that um, we find that transmission should not be one of those classified as uh, gas transmission, at least, should not be one of those classified as a public utility covered by the PCC. We do recognize that gas distribution, electricity distribution, should be uh, classified as uh, public utilities because we recognize them as natural monopolies. So, um, so, so, um, given the ultimate and very urgent objective of ensuring that natural gas supply is available to our citizens, I think. Uh, using a competition lens, unpacking all these concepts through a competition lens in the Philippine context could be achieved through lowering the barriers to entry. Meaning, we may want to rethink uh, requiring uh, possibly uh, the franchise requirement, the legislative franchise requirement for some of the industry players. And that, um, secondly, my second point as to the concepts is. Um, addressing uh, these uh, concerns on the vertical integration and possibly lessening the competition within within the nascent industry is that we establish the, establish the FRAN terms uh, or uh, uh, that we, we built in the uh, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms in the kinds of contracts that our industry players will be, um, uh, will be uh, executing. Uh, we've identified some of the we've identified some of the provisions in the bill uh, that we think uh, the friend uh, it will benefit from uh, putting the friend terms in how uh, we can submit it to the, the committee later uh, but it, uh, section four another one i i'm just uh i'm i'm just uh looking through my uh, list now, attorney, attorney, sir, fake, uh, can you, attorney attorney fake can you uh, rewind for about one minute
Uh, Attorney Fake, uh, please rewind what you said about two, two minutes ago uh, because uh, you got <laughs> cut. Just rewind what you yes, said. Two yes, minutes Mr. Ago. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. I apologize. Um, you, you, uh, you, my, you my... I, based on my notes, uh, the, the, you mentioned about the three concepts fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory uh, aspects. So from then on, you got cut. Yes. So can you repeat from then on? Oh. Oh yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was just uh, I was just um, outlining all the provisions that we've already identified that might benefit from uh, having uh, including the Fran terms in the provision. So um, I can just list it down, send it to uh, to your to your staff, Mr. Chair, um, and we will also be formally uh, submitting our position paper. Um, uh, with the, with the outline of all the provisions that we think should include um, uh, the FRAD terms or, or all the transactions, all the kinds of transactions that should be executed between the industry players uh, that should contain these um, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory uh, provisions uh, when they execute their contracts to prevent um, preferential treatment to those um, uh that are virtually integrated uh virtually integrated uh, entities so um what's the other thing? oh and uh, so lastly our our uh our last point is on a jurisdic jurisdictional aspect i guess um so one of the things that we noted is uh under section sorry Section two. Oh my gosh, sorry. Um, so I think section twelve. Uh, it says here that uh, it gives the PCC primary jurisdiction over any anti-competitive behavior of natural gas industry participants. Um, just to uh, kind of align this with our already existing comprehensive competition law. We would recommend that the provision would uh, would state that the PCC shall exercise original and the primary jurisdiction over any anti-competitive behavior of natural gas industry participants. Um, secondly, uh, we also noted under the declaration of policy uh, that we stated here uh, on section two policy to protect consumers by mandating transparent and competitive rates. It, it, this may seem pedantic, but uh, really, when we say competitive rates, uh, this is really determined by market forces. So we recommend that this be um, changed from competitive to fair. Um, other than that, Mr. Chair, I think it, it would the committee might better appreciate the commission's position um, through our position paper. And if there are any clarificatory questions or or inputs from members of the committee, we would happily address them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank, thank you, Attorney Fui. Uh, Senator Antiveras, any questions to uh, PCC? Not right now, Mr. Chair, but I'll continue listening to our other uh, resource persons as well, as well, and may come back to PCC if a, uh, a question should come up um, across the different agencies. Thank you, Attorney Faye. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator uh, Antiveros. Attorney Faye, you made a very uh, interesting comment that the transmission system uh, will not need a legislative franchise because in PCC's view, it's not considered a public utility, no. But uh, historically, no. Um, uh, transmission systems such as pipelines are given um, a legislative franchise. The one by first gen, no? because the one the pipeline that first gen owns, uh, first gas in particular, has a legislative franchise, no. So. Can you expound further on this uh, 
uh, on this comment and what is the legal basis for uh, PCC uh, to consider pipelines and transmission systems uh, are not public utilities? No. Well, we, we'd like to go back, Mr. Chair, to our position uh, with the list of, uh, of um, public utilities, uh, our recommended public utilities under the Public Services Act, or those that should technically be required to, sorry, technically be required to um, get a franchise or um, or have, um, how do you say it, some ownership uh, limitations, Mr. Chair. So um, we, we did explore uh, in other jurisdictions, there was a list of um, what are considered as natural monopolies. Um, and these, uh, these would include a natural gas um, distribution, meaning the last mile, the one that, uh, one that basically the consumers um, would, uh, would, would um, benefit from. Now, um, we go back to our um, definition of what is a public utility. Uh, uh, based on jurisprudence, we look at uh, JG Summit Holdings, etc. And um, we, we find here that uh, um, there are part, uh, for example, there's a difference, I think, on how we treat the old news transmission system and the Yes, the own use transmission system and the RTPA transmission system, for example. Um, so we find that the proposed provision actually expands the definition of what currently constitutes a public utility, um, which is counterintuitive to the moves to rationalize the coverage of the Public Services Act. So in our position paper, then, um, we propose to limit the coverage of public utility to sectors such as electricity distribution, um, electricity transmission, gas or petroleum pipeline distribution, water pipeline distribution, and sewerage pipeline distribution system. So um, it's, uh, I think we, we based our study or our recommendation then back in the 17th Congress, and we stand by that recommendation now based on studies uh, conducted by the OECD and the World Bank. Um, no, we can provide you with our... So uh, I think, so distribution pipelines are basically the final step in delivering natural gas to last mile consumer to the individual homes. Um, while the transmission systems are really, at least from our understanding, how this bill is treating it, is um, designed as a grid or trunk line system involving the movement of large volumes of natural gas to the middle mile user. So not, so our take really, Mr. Chair, is not, um, while it is a pub, it may have some public uh, use element. Um, it is not really primarily between um, the public and the um, transmission, the transmission player. So, um, unless the natural gas transmission system is actually shown to meet all the public utility criteria based on um, established uh, established criteria laid out by the Supreme Court or under the Constitution, then it should not be classified as a public utility, like a gas distribution system, and may not be actually be subject to foreign ownership limitations as well. So um, again, Mr. Chair, uh, we would be happy to expound on this more in our position paper. Um, uh, there are a bit more of uh, nuances <laughs> that we discuss on with regards to, uh, to why we find that the 
possibly parts of the the, the transmission system might not actually be um, classified as a public utility that may require a franchise. We understand the need for permitting, definitely. Um, it may be a regulatory job, but uh, we we would like to explore this concept further, um, possibly uh, ease the entry of uh, players into the market. Thank you, Attorney Fee. Um, but earlier you mentioned that uh, the PCC considered electricity or electric transmission lines as public utility. Is that is that correct? Did I hear you correct earlier? Um, it's, I, that's correct, Mr. Chair. It's one of our um, our recommended uh, industries to be included under the Public Services Act as a as part of a public utility, as, as public utility. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay. No, because uh, this is a very important um, comment, and um, please substantiate it with uh, your legal basis, uh, because my uh, appreciation of um, public utilities, public utilities have a monopolistic tendency, no? yes. and therefore, uh, you have to regulate it because it's only one, no? And uh, these industries, uh, because of its monopolistic in tendencies, the public has no choice but to use it. Yes. Therefore, yes. government needs to step in and to regulate both pricing and services. Yes. Um, in this bill, uh, the, the LNG transmission line... Um, will be somewhat or probably almost the same as the electric transmission line in a sense that it will only be one of its kind no? mm -hmm. um, because having multiple natural gas pipelines will be quite costly for the public because you cannot uh, achieve economies of scale uh, the reason for this monopolistic tendencies is basically to achieve economies of scale. The bigger you are, the cheaper it is for our consumers. But if you have, let's say, multiple transmission lines, uh, it's not only very difficult to construct because it's a pipeline, but it's also very costly for our consumers because it's not designed that way. Now, for example, just think of right-of-way. If you have multiple right-of-ways, uh, that is quite costly. But if you have only one right-of-way, uh, carrying the same product, then it's uh, you reach or you achieve economies of scale. So, but I would like to give it the benefit of the doubt, no? Because, admittedly, getting a franchise is very difficult. No, it's it's uh, not that easy. It's the same legislative process that we are doing now, and uh, we all know that it's a very difficult process. So, but then again, we cannot do away the, with the requirements of the constitution that uh, if you're a public utility, you need a franchise. So, but I'm, I'm, I, I want to give that the benefit of the doubt because uh, hearing our international resource persons earlier, especially Professor Silke, uh, the, uh, uh, the requirement for a franchise is quite uh, difficult and it becomes a barrier to entry. You know? So right. please furnish us with your legal basis um, on that. Um, I would like to read that and analyze that. And um, yes, yes. please cite also your uh, basis on uh, that declaration that uh, transmission LNG transmission lines should not be declared as public utilities. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may be allowed to just clarify, um, it's not the so we we actually listed down. I, I'm going back again to our position on um, uh, on what should be included in the Public Services Act as. Um, as uh, public utilities, um, we I am I am basing my my statement on on that list, and it is it's quite an exclusive list, but not um, but not uh, without any leeway to further. I mean, depending on the determination of the National Economic Development Authority, etc. Legislature, of course. It's just that based on international studies, again. Uh, 
studies that we've uh, relied upon since the 17th Congress. Um, it is only the, sorry, yeah, uh, sorry. Um, it is only the gas pipeline distribution system and not gas um, transmission system that should be considered as um, uh, part of uh, the public utilities that should be regulated under the Public Services Act, which would then require a franchise and would be subjected to some ownership limitations. But again, Mr. Chair, we will provide you with, um, with our position paper with the detailed um, resources that we relied upon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Attorney Faye. Yes, uh, Santa Teresa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before the chair continues, I'd just like to make of record that um, Attorney Faye's comments are really very important to us, uh, not just considering uh, in another committee the pending public services bill as well, but also um, thinking about it in relation to the bill we are discussing here. Uh, of course, we all know that um, considering several bills uh, parallel is because we're trying to put up a coherent uh, policy framework affecting both energy and, and all other aspects of national development. But I'm hoping and I'm confident that the chair will pursue our consideration of this bill on the development of the midstream gas industry, um, uh, including how it relates to, well, of course, uh, our national interests and even current constitutional principles like the 6040 uh, requirement that Attorney Faye also mentioned. So, um, hindi naman ito usapin ng unahan kung aling bill yung unang matapos at maging batas, but uh, I'm really glad of the opportunity we have, Mr. Chair, in this committee and with our resource persons who are uh, of such great help to us uh, to, to have this space, this time to, to uh, articulate these principles, to debate about them, and to try to come up with the best possible versions uh, of the law, uh, including as uh, uh, as they relate to questions like uh, the commons and uh, privatization and how these two spheres uh, should relate to each other, particularly to us Filipinos at this stage of our development. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at salamat din kay Attorney Faye. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Antiveras. We'll await for... Uh... Uh, we'll await the position paper of PCC, but they're absolutely correct, no? Because uh, that that legal um, uh, basis will have implications on other uh, transmission assets in our country. No, we have water transmission, we have electricity transmission, and now natural gas transmission. No, admittedly, this is a new industry. We don't have such um, industry yet, although there is a precedent. Uh, uh, First Gas owns a pipeline uh, that has a legislative franchise. No, basically it's a transmission pipeline. No, we don't have a distribution pipeline here, not like in the states. But uh, in the future we might have that. No, so um, with that, uh, I, 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 we call on Admiral Lista for his comments. PNOC. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh... Senator Antiveros, and we would like to thank uh, the chairman and uh, the members of the committee for inviting us. This is our first time to join this uh, this uh, endeavor, and uh, we would like to express some comments. We made a position paper, Mr. Chairman. We will submit it to you after we finish its attachments because we just finished it yesterday. But uh, may I just make a few comments that, uh, which I personally feel uh, that uh, maybe we are talking to the wrong consultants, to the wrong people uh, from USA and EU. Well, have we invited uh, our neighbors from ASEAN and ASCO? Because we are more related to them than USA and EU. USA produces oil and gas, and it is a neighbor to the one of the biggest uh, producers of gas. 
EU is the same. They are neighbors to oil and gas producing countries. ASEAN, we, when we came up with uh, the Philippines, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, was one of the first who established their own Philippine National Oil Company, second only to Indonesia. And uh, I do not know what happened, but uh, we, we did not uh, pursue the efforts of developing our oil fields. And uh, so we were left behind. The other countries, Asian neighbors, are successful because they permitted their national oil companies to grow and even develop their own energy direction. Their countries and their people today are benefiting from these steps. ASEAN permitted the national oil companies to help the growth of their energy industry. After we sold Petron, Mr. Chairman, it did not engage in drilling, but concentrated on other, other business proposals that, will, that makes more money for them. After PNOC sold EDC, EDC stopped developing our geothermal projects, except those that could bring profits. It was different with our Asian neighbors. Even today, Mr. Ch Chairman, Singapore, who does not have any gas or oil at all, trades gas to provide 97% of their gas power plants, because 97% of their plants, Mr. Chairman, are powered by gas. Listening from the previous comments from our consultants, we may be looking at the wrong models. We may be, we may be required to come out with more laws. In Asia, the oil and gas industries flourished, not mainly because of the participation of the private sector, but because of the strong and active role of their national oil companies. Indonesia, represented by Pertamina, Malaysia, uh, represented by Petronas, and Thailand, represented by PTT, paved the way in the development of their oil and gas sector. Today, Mr. Chairman, Vietnam and others are not far behind. The Philippines, unfortunately, which was established way, way ahead of them, is now lagging behind because PNOC was emasculated by too many rules and regulations combined with the privatization of its earning assets, while other NOCs are amassing assets. In our experience also, Mr. Chairman, in the Philippine energy business, business it is a dream to have full disclosure. I do not know where trust begins, but I, in my experience in the past years that I've been dealing with DOE, DOE has, that, has been issued TRO several times when it asked for the unbundling of several items and costs. And Transco cannot even inspect NGCP and even PFC, Mr. Chairman, is not sure whether we are getting the right data from Malampaya. As I said, Mr. Chairman, I am, we are in support uh, in your effort to come up with this regulation. But we are submitting a full report on where we should start because it should not be only concentrated on midstream. It should, it should be a total bill that we should address from drilling, midstream to downstream. We are lagging behind because we are looking at, as I said, probably the wrong models. May I recommend, Mr. Chairman, that we invite also good, uh, good resource speakers from our neighbors who can just be here anytime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Admiral Lista. And for the record, uh, those uh, people we invited are resource persons. They're not the committee's consultant. Uh, the, um, we came across uh, CLDP or the Commercial Law Development Program of the uh, uh, U.S. State, United States Department of Commerce because uh, uh, it's one of their programs to help develop um, natural gas industries in uh, developing nations. And um, because of our impending uh, depletion of Malampaya, um, uh, uh, they uh, volunteered, or it's part of the U.S. Go government's um, uh, goodwill program to help us with their 
international experience when it comes to developing natural gas uh, markets. In fact, uh, in fairness to them, uh, Admiral, they submitted to us uh, not only the U.S. experience, but also international experience. Um, actually concentrating on um, the Southeast Asian market. So we've been discussing with them different markets, different jurisdictions, because their group covers the entire world, no? especially developing nations. Um, but we greatly appreciate if you can refer to us uh, other resource persons from developing nations. Uh, the, like I said earlier, and we've also heard from them, that uh, different countries will have different um, situations and uh, the nuances is very critical in terms of developing our law so i would like to um, tap into your uh, network uh, in terms of uh, resource persons and um, uh, people who can help us in uh, sharpening this law as to uh, your comment on um, uh, developing our own indig indigenous uh, source, I fully agree with you. Uh, in fact, PNOCs should be uh, directed and empowered to develop more oil and gas uh, potential in our country. I fully agree with you that uh, we were left behind in the last 20 years. Uh, we only have one source, Malampaya. No? Uh, but we all know that uh, the West Philippine Sea is abundant with oil and gas and it's blessed with resources that we can use for our own people. Unfortunately, uh, you're absolutely correct. It's not being tapped. So moving forward, maybe in a different forum, uh, we will uh, talk to you about how to empower PNOC uh, to jumpstart our own indigenous uh, oil and gas potential. Um, if you look at other countries, in Indonesia, in Thailand, um, uh, all of their national oil companies uh, were tasked and empowered to um, explore and um, harness the full potential of the resources. But that's on a different uh, discussion. So with that, Santa Risa, any questions to PNOC? <laughs> Well, Mr. Chairman, um, th this was actually uh, a question I was originally going to ask the DOE, but since it also pertains to oil, I wonder if uh, President Lista would uh, care to comment on a question about the status of production at the uh, reported Alegria oil field in Cebu, uh, since he, the President Lista was lamenting about how we have not developed our uh, our domestic uh, oil industry. Uh, well, a few years back, government uh, also announced that the Alegria oil field in Cebu was rich in oil and gas and that this would generate numerous job opportunities and income for Filipinos. Uh, would the good president least uh, know, Mr. Chairman, what the status of production is at Alegria, if any, Mr. Chairman? Uh, president Lista, na kami po kayo. You may respond, um, Admiral Lista. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, ASEC Polido or uh, President uh, Ross can answer that properly uh, yes. because they have the data, ma'am. Thank you, sir. ASEC so, uh, Polido, you may respond. Hi, Senator uh, Lisa. Uh, ma'am, uh, regarding your query about the Allegri oil field, um, it's currently ramping up. Uh, there, they've had the uh, uh, experience a few delays. Uh, they're supposed to be submitting a first quarter this year about their uh, production capacity. Uh, but then again, ma'am, their their production capacity is not. Uh, although it is significant from a local perspective, it's not enough to supply uh, at the regional or uh, or even more so at the national level. Mm -hmm. We can submit the data to your office, uh, Senator, for, for, for the specifics of their uh, production for the past year. Yes, please, uh, ASIC Polido. I, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in the next hearing, I'll pursue this question also based on uh, what the DOE will be submitting to the committee. Uh, in relation to the topic of the exploration of, for new domestic sources of natural gas, um, given that Malampaya is expected to significantly decline starting 2024. But aside from Alegria, we are also, and this was discussed in the budget briefing of DOE, we're 
uh, it was uh, told us, told the Senate, that it appears that off North uh, West Palawan, there is uh, the Recto Bank. And then there's also Benham Rice, uh, which has been spoken of by UP Institute of Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea Director Jay Batong Bakal uh, as containing untapped natural gas and heavy metal. So um, then there's also the the presupposition uh, in the bill that we'll be importing a large amount of natural gas. So yes, Mr. Chair, in, in next week's hearing, I'll just follow up with the DOE through ASIC Pulido, uh, not just the one possible source in Alegria, but uh, several, several that if cobbled together, maybe can um, indicate uh, existing or, or persisting potentials, not just for our oil industry, uh, but also the uh, the uh, midstream gas industry contemplated by this bill. Salamat ASEC. Salamat Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Risa. And uh, we have a few more resource persons to uh, to um, to call on. However, because of the uh, because of time constraint, we will uh, suspend the hearing today. Um, and to also give way especially to the Department of Energy and to ERC and to listen to their position paper. Uh, again, to ERC and to DOE, I am imploring on you to, um, to uh, take a look at this bill seriously and uh, come up with a very detailed uh, comment and position on the various concepts in the bill. Um, we've if you look at the bill, there's a whole section dedicated to ERC and to, to, to DOE because of their importance in promoting, developing, and regulating this industry. So uh, again, I would like to remind, strongly remind our uh, um, colleagues in the DOE and uh, ERC to take a look at this bill seriously, <coughs> to come up with a detailed position paper and be ready to discuss it in the next hearing. The next hearing will be on January 12, <coughs> uh, Tuesday, 9 a.m. next week. So with that, uh, before we term it, before we suspend this hearing, any last words from Senator uh, Risa? Uh, no more, Mr. Chair. Uh, marami salamat. At marami salamat din po sa lahat ng ating resource persons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Risa. And with that, I... Thank you and apologize to our resource persons that uh, uh, we didn't have enough time to complete every to complete everyone or to call on everyone. But uh, rest assured, next week we will uh, continue this hearing, and uh, we will uh, more than we will be more than happy to uh, again receive you and to hear your comments. And uh, please feel free to uh, send us your your position paper even prior to the hearing next week. Um, with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your participation. And uh, we will see you on January 12 for the continuation of this hearing. Thank you very much. Meeting is um, suspended. Thank you, Mr. Chair.